Um, I'm Jeremy Dean from Hypothesis, and welcome to this OLC workshop, Mark Up the Margin Annotate Ed workshop. Um, as part of the OLC conference, I think uh, we're kicking it off. I think a lot of their events are next week, and you should check out the programming. Uh, it's a great organization, I think. All the more important in this moment when more folks are uh, delivering uh, their teaching uh, remotely to look at the kind of uh, programming that OLC uh, has to, uh, to help you and help others and your colleagues work, work through this uh, challenging moment in, in, in higher ed. Chat freely uh, in the uh, chat. Uh, you got, we've already started doing that, saying where folks are from, that's great. And then use the Q&A to respond to the panelists or hosts. So that's a more formal, you need something addressed rather than, um, you know, really two kinds of marginalia, if you think about it, right? There's a, the, the formal marginalia, like I need to mark this passage to come back and ask a colleague or, a, or a, an instructor. That's the Q&A. And then the informal marginalia where you're just kind of putting exclamation marks next to some crazy passage in a book that you read, that's the chat. The Annotate Ed community, is a community of educators, researchers, and technologists from organizations across the world that engage deeply with collaborative annotation um, as a transformative practice in teaching uh, and learning. Um, hypothesis towards this community. Uh, we have libraries and schools from all over the country, uh, all over the world, and all, all levels of education. Uh, instructors that are interested in this technology, instructional technologists, um, and all collaborating on uh, the building of this technology, uh, conversations around its implementation and pedagogical strategies uh, for the collaborative annotation technology. Um, and this, this event is sort of co-sponsored by our Annotate Ed uh, community. You may see uh, your institution represented there. So today we actually have two uh, workshop events. Uh, the first one that you're attending right now um, is, uh, is right now session A, um, part of the Mark Up the Margin. Um, and we have several instructors and practitioners joining us to talk about their use of annotation. Uh, and then at the end, or towards the second half of the presentation, uh, we'll be reading and annotating together synchronously um, the historical amnesia of ed tech uh, by OLC um, Innovate 2020 keynoter uh, Martin Weller. Uh, so we'll, we'll be doing some hands-on work after you listen to us talk at you for just a bit about um, what this is all about. So I'm Jeremy Dean from Hypothesis. I'm the Vice President of Education at Hypothesis um, and a lifelong annotator. And so I wanna talk a little bit about the background of annotation. Some of you guys may be new to this technology, at least in the format that we'll be talking about it today. Um, but of course, it's, it's not a new technology. I think that's one thing I always like to say at the beginning of a presentation that annotation has been around for a very, very long time. Um, I annotated in middle school. I can still remember the copy of Black Boy by Richard Wright and you know, my I can even see my sort of seventh grade handwriting in that text, um, a book that I came back to many times again uh, in, in high school and, and college, and then actually eventually it was part of my dissertation uh, when I got a PhD in English. Um, so books that I've gone through uh, many, many times and, and written in the margins as part of my both scholastic student practice, but also academic scholarly practice. Um, I think it's important to say we're not talking about something uh, new here in some ways. So rest assured, those of you guys that are, um, anxious in this new world of, of more and more remote uh, online delivery. Um, we're talking about something that's been around for a while. I used to hand out this poem when I taught English uh, at the college and high school level. Uh, it's a, by Billy Collins. Uh, it's an ode to uh, annotation called Marginalia. And now on the first day of class, every semester, I would, I would hand it out along with the syllabus. We have all seized the white perimeter as our own and reached for a pen, if only to show, we did not just laze in an armchair turning pages, we press the thought into the wayside, planted an impression along the verge. I, I recommend this poem highly. It's really wonderful ode to, to annotation, but it also gets at why I thought this, uh, you know, tool, this practice of annotation was so important for my students. Um, it's active learning, right? Again, this is something that you probably recognize as a, as a sort of buzzword in, uh, in learning conversations, learning circles. Um, Annotation is one of the sort of basic forms of being an active uh, learner and I wanted to have my students do that because I thought that it would be a critical piece of how they built uh, their success in my courses. Um, and again, that's nothing new. It's been around since, I always tell my students never to start a paper this way, right? But like annotation has been around since the beginning of time, right? Um, but in some sense, maybe not since the beginning of time, although I suppose you could say cave drawings are like a sort of kind of annotation. Um, but certainly since the beginning of the, the advent of the book, uh, people have been writing in the margins, sharing their thoughts, using it to better comprehend what they're 
what they're looking at. Um, and as we move online uh, and we start to deliver content more and more online, um, digital delivery of, of, of course readings, uh, we lose this technology, right? So we actually lose what is a tried and true uh, learning practice when we deliver our texts online. Those PDFs don't have a margin, right? A lot of EPUBs don't have a place to, uh, to write in the margin. Um, and so part of what we're talking about today is how does that, uh, you know, ancient technology of annotation move online into the into digital and, and networked uh, spaces. Um, and the good news is that we can annotate online. Um, and I think the better news is that there are a number of affordances that those new learning environments uh, uh, give us that can be part of annotation uh, on the web, annotation sort of 2.0. Um, and so I like to use a quote from Jennifer Howard in the Chronicle of Higher Education to think about what does it mean when that age old practice of annotation, writing with a pen or in, in the margins or highlighting with a highlighter, um, what does it mean when it moves online? And I think this is especially heartening in this moment, uh, this you know, COVID moment of more remote delivery. Online, a book and really any text, right? An article, uh, a poem, uh, even a handout or your own syllabus. Online, a book can be a gathering place, a shared space where readers record their reactions and conversations. I always loved this quote before, uh, you know, last March, um, but I have come back to it uh, since COVID to, because I, I, you know, for many of us, we've lost the kind of central space that we use to teach, right? I know many of you probably teach maybe exclusively online or quite accustomed to teaching online. Um, some, a lot of folks obviously are, are new to that uh, these days. Um, and I think it's important to think about space, spaces we've lost um, and also spaces that, can, that we've gained as a result or that we can try to approximate the, the physical um, classrooms that we are not, um, or certainly we didn't use this spring and, and maybe used in limited uh, amounts um, in the fall. So this is a vision of hypothesis, or this is a vision rather of annotation today, as it exists in digital networked environments, right? Any website, article, ebook, document, or piece of multimedia uh, can have multiple layers of annotation. It can have that traditional layer of marginal notes, private notes that one would take, highlights and notes that one would take as they, uh, as they read to help uh, comprehend and kind of um, put a stake in, 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 their, in their readings to, to come back to. Um, but there is also the possibility, for example, of a public channel of annotation, a shared space where uh, commentators from all across the world could come together and read on a text, which is something that we'll be doing today as part of this uh, workshop. We'll all be annotating publicly on a document um, and you'll experience that public layer. And then of course, there can be any number of private layers, circumscribed reading and annotating groups um, where you might be with colleagues, um, you might just be with, uh, you know, informal a reading group uh, to, to share share notes, um, and then also, of course, classroom private groups where you're sharing the margin. It is a shared space. It is social, um, but it's circumscribed to a, a particular community. I want to just highlight three ways that uh, I've found uh, annotation to be powerful um, online. And one of them is, 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 is true also for analog annotation, right? This idea that annotation uh, makes reading active. But I will just highlight one thing, which is I think that reading being active through annotation is, is not something new. Um, but I think what is new about it is how we can be active. Uh, at least myself, I was, I'm not a good artist, so I wasn't able to draw uh, in the margins. Uh, for example, in my books, I really just had the, the blunt edge of a pencil and you know my scrawl to to mark my way through a text. Um, but one of the things that's really powerful about annotation online in digital you know uh, networked environments is the ability to um, to be active in new ways. Um, and this this screenshot actually captures that. Um, this was an exercise by a professor at uh, at uh, San Francisco State, um, who had students annotate a poem with images, right? Just images. Find an image and attach it to a piece of the text. Make a connection between a piece of this poem and some image that you discover. And the really neat thing was the students got, and I can't scroll through it because it's just a screenshot, but the students grabbed images or created images uh, of all different sorts. 
Um, and it was a great exercise, I think, in visual argumentation or visual rhetoric. So annotation makes reading active, but as we take annotation online, it can be active in new ways, right? Video, audio, combinations of all types of media as part of how students are comprehending, engaging, and analyzing uh, text. This next one, I think, is kind of new. Uh, when I handed out that Billy Collins poem and told my students to annotate, um, it was always uh, sort of aspirational, um, and I would then grade them on a paper, right? I'd grade them on a paper that sort of expected that they'd annotated, that they had some clue about what a good annotation looked like, um, or successful annotation looked like, and then uh, that they had you know, harvested those annotations or added to those annotations in class uh, discussion and then harvested those annotations and then you know, for the paper. Um, but I was grading them on a final product that I could see, the paper, but there was this whole process that was largely invisible to me, uh, the reading process, the reading, comprehending, and analyzing process that isn't really visible in any kind of substantial way when you do a reading quiz or something like that, right? You just have a sense of whether somebody has got a summary of it. Um, of, of what they were supposed to read, which I learned very quickly people can get from Spark Notes quite easily without having actually done the reading. Um, but this idea that hypothesis makes or that annotation makes reading visible, I think is incredibly powerful because it allows us to now see how our students are engaging with text, see how they're engaging with each other around uh, the text and engage with them at that, at that critical moment of, of discovery and processing uh, of course material. And then finally, Annotation makes reading social. And this is incredibly powerful uh, that, I, and I've heard this again and again, both from students and instructors, and especially in this COVID moment that um, they're, they're finding community um, through annotation. They're finding connection uh, through annotation. Yes, it's in the margin of a course reading. Yes, it sort of is focused around comprehension and analysis of course readings, but just the idea of being able to connect in that way, socializing in that way, um, is almost as powerful as the, as the close reading aspect. Um, and this is just a great quote from uh, actually one of Robin DeRosa's uh, students way back when we didn't even have private groups when uh, Robin did her uh, open anthology of early American literature. So all her students were annotating uh, publicly. Um, and this student uh, was annotating publicly. I remember watching them annotate at the time. Um, and this student actually wrote a blog after her experience in Robin's course where she wrote, Hypothesis is my literary Facebook. When I'm reading, I sometimes wonder, does anyone actually understand this? Am I crazy? With this brilliant tool, I know I'm not alone. I just love that idea of not being alone um, for, for college students as they're grappling with difficult text. I mean, even in a normal uh, context, I remember that can be a very lonely experience. Like, what is this stuff, right? It's not like what I read in high school. Um, and, but even more so now, right? When there's a number of other factors that are making us feel alone and, and disconnected and maybe more having a more difficult time connecting to our to our to the work we need to do continue to do as part of our education all right i'm just going to highlight five uh top level sort of ideas about annotation and then turn it over to our experts here i've already sort of said this before but you know again and again teachers will tell me that it's it's not about annotation it's about community i think that's all the more true uh now um so so do think about that and do you know uh Think about the, leveraging the social aspects of annotation as part of your course, not just for reading, but um, in other ways as well. Uh, shout out to Remy Kalir, who looks like he's uh, on, the, on, the, on the call here. Um, one great way to start uh, annotation in a course is to annotate your syllabus or really any of the ancillary materials from a course. Um, to be, again, this is something else we often do in class, right? Read the syllabus or walk through the syllabus on day one. Um, as we're starting to deliver more things, uh, more content online, more teaching online, great to put your handouts uh, in a format that can be annotated to help students uh, clarify uh, and begin thinking about assignments or begin thinking about a course. Uh, and as Ramey writes, um, and maybe Ramey could drop a, a link in the, in the chat here, um, it's also a powerful way to kind of open up your course to uh, the co-design of your, of your students, right? To decenter yourself as the kind of authority and make yourself a little vulnerable and allow for the influence of, of your students and their own expertise and their own ideas about, uh, about the course. You might learn something yourself. I, am, I just wanna emphasize that I am always surprised by 
how teachers use hypothesis um, and how teachers use uh, collaborative annotation as a tool. There's really no one way to do it. My background is in English, so I have sort of very specific kind of close reading ideas, but it's used across the disciplines and across skill levels in all kinds of different ways. And every time I talk with a group of educators, I learn a new way that annotation is being used by, uh, by them and their students. Um, and so I think just turning this tool on, uh, you will discover really amazing things happening uh, in, the, in the margins. One way to use uh, annotation is just to, to guide students through a text. Um, this we see often at, at lower levels of, of education as, as students are kind of newer to the process of reading and annotating. Uh, teachers might gloss a text for students or insert prompts uh, for students as they read um, or insert certain guideposts to help students through a text. Again, uh, it's a great way to be present in your students' reading and uh, that uh, sort of one of the fundamental part of education um, to be there, right? And especially at a time when, um, when we're, our presence is, uh, is it's tough to reconstitute in online environments. I do think the sort of main use case for hypothesis or for annotation is sort of seminar type discussion online. Um, asynchronous discussion where everybody's grounded in the text, um, but engaging with each other. For me, that was always the ideal. I know that's not for every discipline and every, every level, but the idea of everybody sitting around in a circle with their books open and their fingers on a page and talking about a passage was really the, the reason I loved teaching. Um, and I think this is, for my money, uh, one of the best ways to, to reconstitute that experience online. And then finally, any object, any artifact of, of your teaching uh, and your students' learning um, can be annotated, right? It doesn't have to be uh, a Shakespeare play. Uh, it doesn't have to be a published article. It can be your syllabus. It could be your uh, lecture notes. It could be a slide deck for your lecture. Um, and so especially as we, again, lose some of those physical spaces and, and physical activities that we're accustomed to in teaching um, when we move our, our, our teaching and learning online, um, you know, there, this is a way to kind of shore up the gaps, if you will. All right, now for the main event. And we have four practitioners today joining us from all different corners of the earth to talk about how they use, have used annotation or how they have seen annotation used in their schools and in their classrooms. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the group, Rebecca Frost Davis from St. Edwards, the person that's probably closest to me in physical geography, because since I'm also in Austin, Texas, uh, can, uh, can kick it off and then we'll go from there. Good to see you this morning, Jeremy and everybody, and a shout out to my other colleagues at St. Edwards. So there are some other people in Austin I know who are here this morning. St. Edwards is a private Catholic liberal arts university uh, founded by the Congregation of the Holy Cross. We have primarily face-to-face -face undergraduate programs, well, until recently, face-to-face. -face. And we also have some uh, blended and fully online graduate programs. I've been a longtime user and advocate for social annotation, primarily because I love the way it services students' reading practices, so making visible how they're reading the text. And I've also been an advocate for hypothesis because I love it as an open educational process. I love the mission of annotate the web. But here at St. Edwards, I've had a hard time getting people to use hypothesis, the tool on the open web. And one of the barriers has been, it's just an extra step to get your students to log into hypothesis as a separate account. So setting up a separate account and then going out and finding something online, um, is just one more step and you may not have time to do that in your class. So I was excited when Jeremy got in touch with me and said, hey, we have a Canvas plugin now. And we started piloting the Canvas plugin this year and I was actually one of the first people to pilot it. We have a small group of early adopters who are trying it out. I know some of them are here this morning, so shout out Lisa Holleran is one of the people I saw, um, who's also been using it in her class. So. We got the Canvas plugin. I also, for the first time, taught a class for our new doctoral program in higher education and leadership, teaching a class on introduction to digital learning environments. So I thought it'll be great. We'll try Hypothesis out as an example of a digital learning environment. And we started in January. Uh, for the assignment that I did, 
I forked an assignment created by Karen Aker at Hunter College and shared by Jeremy on the Hypothesis website for doing scholarly article annotation. And one thing I know about doing annotation, for me, I, I find it's much better to give students very specific directions on how I want them to approach the annotation assignment instead of just saying, go annotate this text. So the directions that I actually came up with are because we were reading some scholarly articles that had a good bit of theory in them. And I wanted to see if they could understand the theory by seeing if they could apply it. So I asked them to, is there anything you're reading, annotate it if you make some connection to it, if you can see how it applies in your own experience. So sort of connecting theory to practice. I also asked them to do the thing of, if there's something you read you don't understand, try to figure out what it is, go find resources online, link them back into the text so that you can better understand it. And then finally, I wanted them to reply to somebody else. Uh, so I gave them those specific directions. Um, as I said, I did it in my class that started in January as one of the first people. So we did discover a few pitfalls. One thing we learned is you can't copy hypothesis assignments. So for our grad programs, we build our courses in a development course and copy them into the production course. That didn't work. But once we figured that out, uh, after having all of my students not be able to get into the reading they were supposed to be annotating, um, it actually worked great. Um, I was just blown away and it was great to see them engaging actively with the text. One of the um, unexpected outcomes I saw is it was the first week of class. This was one of their early assignments and I actually felt like I got to my, know my students better by asking them how they personally connected to the text we were reading than by the getting to know you discussion we had done earlier. And this is a class that was fully online. And so seeing all the different perspectives they brought to the text was really fantastic. Um, another unexpected or maybe sort of expected outcome is that I had one of my students say, you know, I've always hated reading digitally, but I love this. I had no idea that you could annotate the text, you could write in the margins, you could highlight. And I think that was what Jeremy was speaking to. They have these habits that they're used to in print reading and they haven't been able to figure out how to do that digitally. So that was also a big takeaway. Um, and that aspect of digital reading has been very important for us because we've been trying to build capacity in digital reading at St. Edwards for a number of reasons. For one, we've been trying to advocate for open educational resources so that students can, uh, we can reduce textbook costs for our students. We also were and are launching a number of undergraduate general education courses online this summer. But we knew if we were doing online courses for undergrads that we needed to help them be able to read digitally. And also 95% of our library collections are digital. So digital reading is something that our students have to do but there are also barriers for our students when they're reading digitally. Normally, if they're used to reading social media or news sites online, they tend to get distracted while, while they're reading. In fact, all of us, when we're reading digitally, we are conditioned to skim through text, to link out, to follow trails, um, and not stay focused and engaged in a text. And what we know is that if we can actively get our students engaged, they can help focus their attention on the text. And social annotation is one of the things that can help them do that. So um, I was happy to have that confirmed in my own class. Now we're taking a much uh, bigger leap from Austin, Texas, all the way to Armenia. And uh, Alitza will share some of her experiences. Hello, we are. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Good morning, everybody. It's night here. It's Friday night and I uh, can't uh, have a better time spending it with you, all of you annotators mm -hmm. in the United States and across the world. I'm sending a little postcard from the back, my background here. I'm sitting in a, what we call it, university uh, here in Armenia, the Red Hall. Uh, it is in our building and it used to be actually the uh, place where the Central Committee of the Armenian Communist Party used to meet. So it's a little bit of a postcard from far away and from back in time. So I just wanted to give it this flair. Um, we have been using um, at the American University of Armenia uh, hypothesis in the last uh, uh, semester as a pilot, a part of the pilot project of uh, hypothesis. But I have personally been using it for two uh, semesters since uh, the fall, and I have really liked it. I really liked also how my students reacted to it. I have a lot to add to what Rebecca had already noted because uh, 
my students uh, have reacted to this type of digital reading in a very similar way, but let me really quickly recount a little bit of the differences, especially based on how we have uh, 93, 94% of our students are speakers of English as a foreign language or as a second language. So that makes a little bit of a difference. And also uh, through my experience of trying to help faculty uh, integrate hypotheses into their classes, I can talk to you about uh, some suggestions uh, or give you some suggestions of what you need to maybe consider uh, when you decide to use hypotheses if you haven't done so yet. Um, I have been using, uh, we have the LMS app, which is the tool in Moodle. Um, and um, that again, just like Rebecca explained, does not require that uh, each student's individual, each student individually has to have an account. So everybody goes into their Moodle page and then um, uh, they get their identity under the hypothesis app and they get to use any text and just like rebecca we have loved the digitalized text because uh, in armenia um, a lot of our students come from a social cultural i'm sorry probably social political um, economic background that does not allow them to buy um, to afford to buy textbooks so we do everything possible to um, create um, to work with our library uh, we have fantastic librarians who are really helpful in digitizing and helping us uh, uh, legally use a lot of the text in digital environments. So our students, if they like it or not, they work a lot with the digital texts. And um, I think that Hypothesis has introduced an interesting social element to uh, the reading that, uh, um, uh, that has helped them also throughout the pandemic. One of the, uh, in one of the surveys, uh, not in one actually, in most of the most of the comments that I've heard by my students um, on hypothesis is that it has kept them um, close as a community, community of learners throughout these days. Um, so, uh, and similarly to again, I will refer to what Rebecca said. They are they are present yet, um, even even if far away, they're um, in this uh, type of uh, social media. As uh, Jeremy described one of uh, the comments on hypothesis, where they can relate to the personal but also do some work and um, I love that part and I think that they appreciate it too. Um, I have tried using hypothesis in several different levels of classes uh, and that's why I wanted to point to that because uh, I found out that my freshman and my sophomore are much more flexible and much more willing to learn how to use this uh, type of uh, social um, uh, reading uh, compared to the senior class and also I had a, um, a graduate class that was completely react reluctant. Of course, they were um, a little bit older, a little bit more mature, and they were already used to reading on paper and were not as excited about this social media of, uh, of reading. Um, when you get your students uh, going, they really, um, and when you uh, create specific assignments as Rebecca was pointing to, uh, her method of doing that, so they really get going. So, uh, for example, in my American literature class from last semester, I would have an average between 500 and 700 annotations for reading. Um, so sometimes um, uh, before class, I would not have the time to go through all of them and not all of them necessarily are very thoughtful, which also makes it fun for students because uh, they don't always want to answer to your very uh, specific questions and I give them uh, the uh, option to also be a little bit more goofy. Of course, there are certain, uh, there are certain limitations that I set um, ahead of time. Um, one other benefit for, again, uh, speakers of uh, English as a foreign language is that sometimes we read texts like, let's say, Old English, Middle English, or uh, we had particularly great fun reading um, uh, Lewis Carroll's Nonsense uh, Verses, and uh, students uh, created this amazing list of vocabulary that they truly uh, enjoyed and interacted with each other and what what would that mean and it was a lot of fun but but for them and for me and as jeremy said uh, this is also a great space where we as instructors can learn from our students and it's more of a you know um standing a little bit to uh, to the back where uh, you see um these students get so excited about learning on their own and about helping each other understand language uh, uh, delve deep into um, some more serious and philosophical questions. Um, regarding the um, regarding the considerations that I think people need to um, uh, regarding the suggestions that I have and how to integrate that into your classes, you need to decide if uh, 
uh, this, hap, uh, this app or this new functionality of reading uh, really is going to help you meet the learning outcomes of your class. And I'm saying that because I've talked to a lot of faculty who uh, don't see necessarily a value to using hypothesis in their classes. And I can, um, I, I can understand that perhaps it works much better in a humanities class, in a literature class, and it works in a math class. Although I saw somebody in the chat said that it supports LaTeX. Okay, you math people are probably very happy about that. And I don't know to what extent you can uh, uh, use it, but um, is, is, uh, in, is the, the way in which I, for example, is in my literature class um, can. So um, this is really important. And then once you set up the um, uh, expectations, I usually sit down with my students and we design a rubric uh, that we use uh, um, to grade their uh, annotations. And of course, that's in case uh, you use uh, annotations as a graded assignment. And I do encourage uh, you to do that because um, it's hard to um, it's hard to engage students. It's hard to make students do it if if they know that they're not graded. I went to um, I went that far that this semester I had uh, in in one of my classes. It was forty percent of their final grade annotations. They took it very seriously, and that resulted in. Uh, much more prepared students who come to class, students who have already discussed the reading amongst themselves, um, students who have looked up whatever they didn't know, and then um, that created a great uh, classroom environment, both in a face-to-face -face co uh, context when we were meeting still in face-to-face -face and in an online context. So that's again, um, something to consider. How are you going to make them do it and maybe sitting with them and creating an evaluation rubric, uh, which also connects your learning outcomes is a great idea. And last but not least, it's really important to know that uh, this is, uh, there's not just one way to use hypothesis. There's so many different uh, assignments and activities that you can create. You can have them, you can have your students work in group in case you have big classes. You can have them um, answer specific questions. You can all the, uh, use all the functionalities on um, uh, the app uh, and uh, the team of hypothesis is very responsive and they always work on some new functionality that they add. But for example, I have loved using the tag system or um, I make my students go and search through the text for specific uh, language and, and we do discussions on that. So um, there's, a, there's a lot to be discussed with regard to the different activities. And I know that Jeremy is creating a bank of uh, such um, assignments and I, I can't wait to talk to all of you who have tried using hypothesis and have uh, something to teach me and uh, uh, talk about that different ways in which we can use it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alitza. Uh, yes, and so just in terms of hypothesis support and responsiveness, I'm seeing that support and responsiveness in the uh, Q&A or in the chat here from my colleague, Michael. So shout out to Michael who is our uh, a support engineer uh, who's also on the call. Um, and so we're, we, we have geographic diversity in terms of our media. We also have sort of institutional diversity in the sense that we started with a small liberal arts college in, in Austin and we went to an American university in Armenia. And now we're going to the Ohio State University. You have to have the V there, one of the biggest state universities in the country. Uh, and Charles Logan will share his experiences there. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks everybody for joining today. Um, I am the educational technologist in the College of Education and Human Ecology at The Ohio State University. Um, and um, for the most part, my students are actually faculty and uh, fellow colleagues. My background is as a, a high school English teacher, so um, annotation and literature are near and dear to my heart. But in terms of what my classroom looks like since joining um, high, the world of higher ed sort of two years ago at this point, um, it really comes down to different professional development, ongoing learning opportunities that I organize and facilitate for um, faculty and staff. Um, and so I try to think about how I can incorporate uh, online annotation into those experiences and just wanted to share two um, recent experiences. The first is as a book group. Um, so I'm currently facilitating a book group on sort of online learning from the student perspective and offering um, the ability to uh, annotate the text uh, as one way to engage with both the text, but also with um, your fellow book group members. And uh, that was actually through a partnership that uh, my university has um, with Johns Hopkins and the um, 
uh, what's the name of that program, Jeremy? Uh, the education that, school. With yeah, that, at the press there. Uh, I can't remember Muse? where it is. Yes, Muse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I was able to take the um, through our library, um, uh, host those those PDFs for folks to to um, um, to annotate, um, and then. Nice thing about that experience, or one of the nice things, has been that um, the the asynchronous conversation that's happening uh, in the margin then can drive the synchronous discussions that we hold over Zoom. And so um, I have a sense going into our um, you know our synchronous sessions where people are interested in talking about within the text. Um, I can actually pull different quotes or different annotations um, and refer to specific moments within the text. Um, and then uh, that can, I think, create a little bit more of a focused conversation. Uh, I can also use those annotations to help me get a better understanding of different conversations that might happen, uh, for example, in a Twitter slow chat. So I also use Twitter slow chats as another um, asynchronous way to um, engage with uh, different ideas and, and people. And so um, you can certainly have a record of the conversation that was happening uh, within the margins of a text and then continue that conversation in a, in a different um, format uh, that also might open up the conversation um, to the world beyond just the sort of closed off um, uh, book group uh, because we are running it through um, Canvas. Um, so that's one way to do it. Um, another is just through um, workshops that I've led, um, most recently with our teacher education program managers. Um, and so I um, was invited to uh, join the retreat for two hours and um, did some actually synchronous uh, annotating, which we're going to do shortly here. Um, uh, but it, there was a big sort of concern about, how, well, how do we create community in an online course? So rather than just sort of talk about it with one another, which we did do, um, but we were able to read articles that I had found um, about how do you create community online um, and so sort of live that experience. I also think um, it's important for faculty and staff who are going to ask their students to annotate um, to actually have the experience from a student perspective. Um, and so I think that was also important for me is, is when I'm organizing these experiences to think about, well, what is it like for someone who may be assigning a, a reading um, via hypothesis in Canvas or another LMS or on the web to actually experience it from a student perspective? So uh, that experience, um, annotating the article about community, then led into a discussion both about the articles, but also right sort of that meta level discussion of all right, well, well, we did just build a community um, within our within ourselves. So. Um, those were two experiences that uh, just recently um, I wanted to, to share. Thanks, Deb is here, <laughs> my colleague who was part of that, that training. Uh, that, and so, yeah, I think there um, are also ways that um, you can think about um, using a hypothesis um, with one another um, as, as colleagues and not just with students as well. Thanks, Charles. Uh, now we're moving to, to New York State and going to, again to from a big institution to a smaller one. Um, and Christine has been using Hypothesis uh, for several years at, at Colgate, and they're now piloting Hypothesis. So I'm, I know she has a lot. I've been thinking about this type of technology a lot and how to and, um, is used in the classroom. So we'll turn it over to Christine. Thank you, Christine. Hi, everybody. So I'm so excited to be here to be talking about Hypothesis and to share my experience at Colgate. Um, Colgate is a small liberal arts, residential liberal arts college, upstate New York. We're outside of Syracuse. So hi to the people here from Syracuse and Ithaca. We're not too far away. Um, so I'm going to um, talk, kind of tell the story of efforts I'm taking as an instructional designer to build the community of faculty who are using Hypothesis in their courses. Um, our colleague Nate at Hypothesis gave us the prompts as panelists to talk about how did Hypothesis start at your school, who's using annotation, and what's next. So that's going to be kind of the frame for my story. So Hypothes Hypothesis at Colgate, um, I want to say it started on Twitter with me. Um, I was, I had a, um, came across Dr. Remy Kalir, who I believe is joining us today, and um, he does research at the University of Colorado Denver on open web annotation in an educational context. And Remy had been 
tweeting about the, um, the annotated syllabus, hashtag annotated syllabus. Um, Jeremy mentioned that earlier as a way to have your students engaged with your syllab syllabus is to annotate it. So um, Remy was tweeting about that. I thought that was really interesting. I was retweeting his tweets and a professor at Colgate in geology came across my tweets and um, it really piqued her interest. So she got in touch with me. We met face to face in real life, took it off of Twitter and worked together to design the annotated syllabus project for her course, but also other activities as well as designing assessment for um, measuring learning outcomes related to the use of hypothesis. So she was really my first faculty partner. Um, then, you know, started thinking about how can we introduce hypothesis to other faculty members. And at Colgate, back in normal times, face-to-face -face workshops really weren't highly attended. So my colleagues and I designed a new sort of session, we called it a spotlight session, where we invited just a small group of faculty members to come sit on the couch in our office, and we pitched hypothesis to them. We were sort of playing devil's advocate um, we, we know the value of the educational value of hypothesis, but we were sort of playing devil's advocate around like, here's this tool hypothesis. Here's all the things it can do. What do you think of this? So from that meeting, that actually launched two more faculty members who wanted to use hypothesis in their course. It took them about six months to come back to me and actually want to integrate hypothesis into their courses. But, um, um, but I think at Colgate, we're a face-to-face liberal arts college really face-to-face -face relationship building is really key um, to faculty adoption of technologies so the way in which we introduced hypothesis to faculty members i think was really important in piquing their interest in the tool and then working to build partnerships with them to integrate it into their courses all to say um, at colgate starting to develop a small community of practice among a few hand faculty members who are using hypothesis and as an instructional designer it was important that i actually bring them together so that they can share their ideas lessons learned how they're using hypothesis what worked well or not um, so that has been really successful here at colgate i want to then fast forward to spring 2020 this past semester we were piloting the hypothesis um, moodle app so again, bringing new people into the conversation around hypothesis, new courses. We have people from history, geology, Spanish, um, biography, geography, the arts. So we do have an interdisciplinary group of faculty who are using hypothesis. So again, bringing them together and share, having them share their ideas has been really key. Um, then of course, in during the transition to emergency remote online teaching whatever you want to call it the pivot um i did have to offer workshops but there was a high demand for new tools um, to use in online coursework it just also so happened at colgate we um people like threw together a web page around digital tools and it just so happened that hypothesis got listed at the top of the list like a, a head of zoom so that kind of worked out that people just are like um raising it have a raised sense of awareness of hypothesis as a tool for keeping students engaged in readings. So I did offer workshops in which um, I really draw on hypothesis's um, teacher, uh, teacher resource guide. So if Michael could provide a link to that, that guide has been really key for my um, pitching hypothesis to faculty members because it has curated um, a curated list of example assignments as well as the websites or the web pages that were annotated as part of those example websites. So it's been really helpful for me to be able to show people the assignment and here's what the web page looks like and here's the conversation that unfolded as a result of the assignment. So those have been really helpful for me. That's been a really great resource to share with faculty. So during the emergency pivot, I got new people who adopted hypothesis and actually ended up using it in really creative ways. I had two faculty members who ended up designing final exams using hypothesis. One professor had their students um, use their annotations to create a supplement to uh, two chapters from their main textbook, which I thought was really interesting as a final assignment. And another professor who used, um, she had been using hypothesis throughout the whole semester. And as her final exam, she had students go back and they had to choose one other annotation from one reading for each week. So it was a 12 readings, 12 annotations, 
and their final exam assignment was to respond to at least one of those annotations in a substantive way, either respond to a comment, if somebody added, answered a question and there was a mistake, fix their mistake. Um, and so the, um, all 12 annotations was their final exam. So I thought that was a really interesting use of hypothesis. So again, at Colgate, the key has been building the communities of learn, of, of building a community of practice, essentially, among all the faculty who are using hypothesis and creating ways as the instructional designer to facilitating discussion among the faculty members about their interesting uses um, lesson, and lessons learned for its success. And so I just want to say I'm right now in my workshops that I'm offering about hypothesis. I'm really pitching this as a tool for community building. I know one of the challenges, especially at a liberal arts college where face to face instruction is key is that faculty are really concerned about how do I build community among students who I've never met and among students who've never met each other. So I'm just pitching hypothesis as providing yet another space online where students can meet and connect and engage with their peers and with the instructor. And I also just have to share what something that gives me faith in hypothesis as a really, or what I find really compelling about hypothesis is that um, it does provide these spaces for people to connect. And I've had some interesting experiences just in my own professional development in meeting um, total strangers in the margins of text, for example, in the marginal syllabus project, um, if somebody could link to that as well. I first met Charles, the fellow panelists, in the margins of a text that was part of the marginal syllabus. And then I actually met Charles and others at Digital Pedagogy Lab in real life. And we already had a connection because Charles had made some very thoughtful, um, really deep annotations or replies in response to some of what I was saying. So it was just really great that hypothesis Charles and I already had a connection and then it was nice to meet in real life. So I, all of that to say, I know as um, an instructional designer, just as a learner myself, that hypothesis can really um, create um, meaningful connections between people. So that's something I very much am pitching when I talk to faculty about hypothesis. And that's it. That's lovely, Christine. Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, Annotation can be a unique tool in that way that it's not just a classroom technology that um, maybe gets disposed of after uh, you know the quiz has happened or the plagiarism software has run. It's a tool that is useful to students beyond the classroom as well as to uh, scholars and, and you know intellectuals as they continue their practice that you know is not just classroom based. So that's that's lovely. Thanks for that. Without further ado, I wanted to move to the next chapter in our program today, which is um, what we're calling Notes from the Field. You'll notice that each, uh, each section of the program does have a little bit of a pun embedded in it. So we have um, with us Veronica Armour, Monica Brown, Ben Croft, and Kat King. And they're gonna just spend a couple minutes each talking to you about uh, what's happening with um, collaborative annotation at their, <clears throat> their schools. And um, Veronica has bravely uh, been willing to go first because she's alphabetical by last name. Uh, are you still ready for that, Veronica? Um, so yeah, I uh, when Nate and Jeremy approached me to talk about how Rutgers is using hypothesis, I was as usual willing to say yes, let's do this because when I learned uh, last year that hypothesis integrated with Canvas, I went finally this is my in for getting faculty to use it because we don't have to worry about creating student accounts, creating additional instructions for instructors to be able to use it and so I immediately contacted them about being able to integrate it with our canvas to then roll out and that's when the department I support at Rutgers the School of Communication and Information decided to sign on for an actual pilot to see if um, it would be something that our faculty would use and I automatically had a, a handful of instructors that wanted to use it. Fast forward a year to January 2020 before everything you know went off the rails. And I was talking about it with our larger instructional technology group to say like, hey, this is what we're doing. It seems to have some interest in here, but in terms of licensing, we need more people on board. And we and we showed people what it was. And then once coronavirus hit and we had to go all online, all of a sudden it was like, wow, there's this tool that we have available to us. And our interest has really jumped. Now we've gone from just having a, one little department within the university piloting it, but the entire university is piloting it. So we have a lot more support from our IT department and how it's integrated and used. 
and we just actually had a uh, workshop for our community last week. I was too busy to join, but I heard we had 30 attendees, which um, for those of you that work in instructional design, that's a phenomenal number to have show up to, you know, to hear about something. And so I'm pretty psyched that and hopeful that this will end up being something that we adopt full time to be used for our faculty. And it's just been really nice to work with uh, Nate and Jeremy on seeing this grow and adapt and trying to help where I can to grow it. You know, um, as a state university that's large, we're pretty decentralized. So whenever I get a chance to kind of talk about it with people, it helps. And I've been lucky that another instructional designer at one of our other campuses has also taken to Hypothesis so much so that she presented at our Rutgers online conference a couple weeks ago about using it and talking about social annotation. So what you all heard from Jeremy there, she did a version and showed how she used it in her class. So we're really growing our community and I'm excited to see where it goes from this. So that's, that's my update. That's so great, Veronica. And um, we are gonna have some time for Q&A too, if you don't mind sticking around for a little bit, I know that you have to go. Um, but let's get some of the other folks into the mix here, if that's okay, first. I will introduce our team. Uh, I'm Ben Croft. I work at Boise State University, which is located in Boise, Idaho, in the United States. Um, and my colleague and co-presenter today is Monica Brown. Um, do you want to introduce yourself, Monica? Yeah, so I'm the OER coordinator for eCampus Center at our institution. So I help implement free and open resources in our online courses and programs. So we have had some, a lot of personal experience with social annotation over the last year. And the work that we're doing is feeding into a lot of projects that we're continuing on with open education, open pedagogy, um, and social justice work that we're doing in instructional design. Um, so today, we're really just gonna talk about a project we did last fall, um, how we approached that project with social annotation, and then kind of how um, some pieces of it are rolling on into future conversations. Um, so, uh, like I said, we work at eCampus Center at Boise State University. Uh, we work with a wide variety of instructional designers, faculty, um, faculty associates, online course technologists, um, all of which support this growth of online education at the university. Um, so naturally, as we move a lot of online courses or courses online, um, the question of how to have engaging and authentic peer-to-peer -peer interaction is something that comes up almost every day. Um, our team, the research and innovation team at eCampus Center, has adopted a research framework that centers inclusion in everything we do related to research. We need to have inclusive statements and ensure that there's no harm being done in the research process. Um, and so when we come to these conversations about authentic and engaging dy and dynamic conversations inside of a classroom, um, the conversation often turns to the potential for online uh, discussion boards to be under engaging or even harmful, especially if they're not frequented um, constantly by instructors or teacher teaching assistants. Um, so when we think about annotation and online discussion, um, and we think of that with an inclusive framework, uh, we really need to start thinking about how concepts like public scholarship, uh, surveillance, um, implicit bias, identity-based microaggressions can impact how students experience the online classroom differently. Um, and addressing that power differential between students is especially important when we're discussing concepts related to identity, um, as is often the case with a lot of um, the discussion-oriented courses that we offer through eCampus. Um, so when we're thinking about social annotation, it's a little bit of a different story that, than when we're thinking of discussion forums, because instead of a student sitting and writing maybe a paragraph or two about their reflections on a reading, they're actually in line with the material writing and commenting. Um, and that's what gives social annotation its power and flexibility to be adaptive to whatever type of situation the faculty wants to provide for their students. Um, that said, it can also get a little unwieldy if faculty aren't prepared for supporting students um, with uh, ensuring that the environment remains inclusive and free from hostility or discrimination. Um, and so as Monica and I were helping a faculty scaffold a research project around social annotation, we collated a list of practices that uh, we thought were particularly helpful with ensuring that um, social annotation remains inclusive um, and that if harm does occur um, in the classroom, particularly for historically marginalized students, uh, that, some, that we will have a support system in place. 
Um, so some of these practices include things like monitoring social annotation frequently, um, the time from a harm-based incident to an instructor's response is critical to ensuring that that's the student who um, was harmed in that process um, has support. Uh, offering consistent opportunities for students to reflect on their experience of social annotation assignments throughout the course, uh, maybe providing a way for students to um, name or report any type of discrimination or harm happening in the online environment. Um, we need to start planning for when and not if discriminatory or hostile posts come up in the discussion uh, in the discussions of social annotation and faculty should have a plan in place for when it happens um, so instead of scrambling to figure out what to do if something does arise the faculty will be prepared already um, and then one of the biggest uh, practices we suggest for faculty is um, Planning for um, contact with institu institutional resources at your college, university, or school, um, diversity offices, offices of teaching and learning, um, student support centers. These resources can help tailor um, what you're doing with a social annotation assignment. And if you need any help developing inclusive strategies for doing so, they can be a great resource. Um, so with an inclusive uh, centered approach to social annotation, we think that it can offer a lot of really cool ways to engage with students, especially as we're moving a lot of courses online due to COVID-19. Um, and this conversation is really just getting started. So Monica and I hope that uh, we can continue that conversation and you're all willing to help us. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Monica. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, so you did a great job outlining kind of our underlying approach to how we implement tools at eCampus. Um, we're trying to be very intentional and not choosing tools for tools sake. And we found the hypothesis really aligned well with our values. Um, and so I want to talk about a particular use case that we used. Um, we are trying to build as many Z degrees as we can, trying to infuse OER through our online courses and programs. Um, and so in that process, I helped develop a theater history textbook last summer with the help of a faculty member. We pulled materials from the public domain and put that up there. Um, unfortunately, when you're pulling those kind of like bare minimum texts, you don't have access to the annotations that make the text make more sense. Um, that's the kind of thing that you might see in a Norton or an anthology. Um, and so as we launch this book, part of the, the work of integrating this OER is making sure that there is supportive content available for students to help understand. Um, and Hypothesis is kind of this great tool to add to the book while also helping students unpack and understand it. Um, so in the in the semester that this was implemented, students were able to ask questions in line and have the faculty add more context um, to these like historic plays that they are reading. Um, they were able to have conversations about how it was staged and share clips, video clips of the scenes um, as they've been interpreted by various modern play companies. Um, and so all of those things kind of compounded together to make this really interactive experience and really leverage the OER. Um, and so we find it to be a really complementary tool for OER. Um, and it can be helpful in identifying those kind of pedagogical gaps as well. So the faculty member also wrote little introductions to each section of the book. And in those introductions, um, she kind of explains what's the, the philosophy behind why we're choosing these plays. Well, oftentimes it's just based on the canon. It's the way we've always done it. And that prioritizes certain viewpoints and perspectives over others. Um, and it limits the scope. Um, and so she also seeded the book with questions to have students think through why are these decisions being made and then have conversation in the actual introductions to their plays about how, how, how these decisions are being made and how we can expand the, the canon to be more inclusive. Um, so we're not just getting this really limited worldview, um, even though the scope of the course was still limited, right, with only being seven weeks and things like that. Um, so we were really um, excited to see it work really well. The faculty member reported finding it to be way more engaging than the discussion boards. Um, as a part of implementing it, she didn't wanna go entirely away from discussion boards. Um, so what was really cool was to see the contrast between the weeks and she's like, there was no, there was just, it was just so obvious. Like the discussion boards were less engaging, less interest, less student writing, less replies, as opposed to the, um, annotation weeks where they were just talking together in the play itself. Um, so we just wanted to share that out. We are also piloting a, more um, at our, across a couple of different departments this fall. 
Um, another area of interest we've seen a lot is from our graduate social work program, um, in part because you can annotate across the web. Um, a lot of folks are really in that program are interested in starting to use it with their graduate students to teach them good research practices, tagging and searching and making sure that they can keep track of their research annotations. So those are kind of the two big areas we're seeing it in our online programs. Um, so, yeah. Um, oh, and I'll drop a link to the OER textbook in the chat if that's helpful. I saw that there might be Great. a request for yes. it. I was going to mention that, Monica. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and there's also some questions queuing up for you guys, too. Um, but I want to give Kat a chance to also talk, and then we'll kind of move into the Q&A mode. And hopefully, Veronica can, can stay around for a few more minutes uh, for that part. Um, Kat, do you want to introduce yourself and uh, share what's going on with annotation at your school? Yeah, I'd love to. And let me um, share my screen if people don't mind. Um, can you see a slide there? Yes, we can. Diablo okay, perfect. Vale. Um, perfect. So um, I just uh, will point out, so I'm Kat King. I'm an instructional technologist at Diablo Valley College and an English instructor at Las Positas College um, in California. I, uh, I think it's important to note, I, you know, work in the community colleges and I think that um, hypothesis can be a particularly valuable tool to support reading in the community colleges. Um, you know, sort of like most K-12 schools, the community colleges don't have a competitive application process and um, that kind of filters out students based on their um, based on their abilities. And so, um, you know, we, we serve everyone and um, that can sometimes provide some additional challenges at the community colleges um, then, you know, because we serve adult students and adult students vote with their feet, um, if a student feels unsupported, they drop out, they leave. Um, and so the focus at community colleges is has really been about like high quality, you know, high impact teaching and student support. And so, um, you know, there were, there were quite a few of us on our campuses uh, um, that became interested in hypothesis. And, you know, um, I think our interest in hypothesis was in part, we were looking for answers to questions that educators often um, talk about. Um, mainly around, you know, why students are struggling with reading and you get any group of educators together and the speculation starts, right? Like are, are students just too busy to read? Are they too distracted, you know, or are they too apathetic? Um, in California, we have uh, Assembly Bill 705 that a lot of people talk about and I imagine there are similar bills in other states and countries and um, where you know, uh, we kind of dismantled a lot of the remedial level uh, support English classes for students, you know, for some compelling reasons. But, um, but also we had, you know, faculty who were like, how do we now support students without these um, sort of remediation classes? Um, you know, people wonder, is it me? And one of the things we are, you know, attracted to about hypothesis is it has the ability to kind of make reading visible because it's, you know, digital and social. And so we were hoping we could kind of see some answers. Um, regardless of sort of the reason why, we do know that, you know, reading instruction in the United States is problematic. Um, some of the data there is like, uh, really jarring and shows there are some pretty disproportional educational outcomes for students along um, along racial lines that um, but you know even without considering race like some of our statistics for uh, reading proficiency are not not very good and so you know we wanted to take a look at you know what are some of the issues and how can we help support students who are you know, n not reading it at a high college level. Um, another interest in hypothesis that was, you know, personal is um, dyslexia runs rampant in my family tree. Um, it's the most common learning disability 
it's, you know, impacting up to 20% of the population. And, you know, I often hear people talk about, well, you know, maybe students just aren't, aren't doing the reading or they're not putting forth the effort or they're not, you know, kind of engaging. And, you know, it's very possible that uh, we have many students in our classes that are trying to do the reading, uh, but that, you know, the effort they're putting into reading is not producing the same outcomes. You know, they're not getting the same results that um, we do have, you know, many students with dyslexia who are going to struggle with written language and with processing, um, processing text. And so um, we were hoping Hypothesis might be a way to help support students who um, were, are, you know, uh, emerging readers. And um, our pilot had many positive outcomes. We did, uh, we used Canvas as our learning management system. And so we did integrate with the LMS, which helps onboard a lot of faculty. Um, uh, but what we found was, you know, that ability for instructors to go in and pre-annotate something uh, was, was wonderful. It gave students, you know, reading is so isolated. It's an isolated activity. We send our students home to do it alone, alone by themselves. Um, with Hypothesis, now students, as they're reading, can see that comment from their instructor um, that, you know, helps them process a, a, a text, a difficult text. And, um, they can even see, you know, like our, our students can help with that scaffolding. So our strong, you know, students who excel at reading are now modeling strong reading strategies for our struggling readers. And so that was a, a really powerful kind of thing people loved about hypothesis. Um, the ability to layer in image and, you know, whether that's memes or GIFs or um, you know, a quick YouTube video or something from Khan Academy or even podcasts, you know, and audio as an annotation, we found really helped make students who struggle with, you know, heavy reading based learning uh, feel supported and be able to understand concepts. And um, also just uh, people, whether it was face to face instructors before the, uh, the campuses shut down or in the online classrooms instructors and students alike reported that that social annotation really led to an increased sense of community which was you know really great um, because also uh you know i'm sure spring 2020 is going to live on with in all of our memories um uh, uh as most of our campuses shut down due to um the virus and the pandemic and so um it, it was great that Hypothesis kind of allowed us to have this tool to really process what was going on with students. Here was one of my favorite student annotations from last semester, um, just the image there, right? I'm, I'm gonna be real pissed if I get my shit together and then the world ends. Um, and so, um, uh, many of our instructors uh, in our district were using Zoom to kind of transition to provide that support to students online. Um, and Zoom can be wonderful. Here we are all today on Zoom, which is great. Uh, but it's also prone to a lot of issues, whether that's, you know, poor connectivity or Wi-Fi or audio feedback or, you know, in my case, sometimes screaming kids down the hall, um, you know, people's job schedules change. There can just be a lot of, uh, a lot of side effects of trying to keep that synchronous, um, synchronous momentum. And so one of the things people uh, loved, and we saw this huge surge of interest in hypothesis after the campus closures, is that hypothesis allowed for some asynchronous community building. And so, um, you, you know, students could dialogue with each other and, you know, at a time that worked for them. So, you know, I had students who would get up at 6 a.m. and annotate something before their kids woke up and other students that would annotate something at midnight after they got off their late night shift. Um, and, you know, 
So students could dialogue with each other, and here's just a screenshot of students replying to each other, but they're also dialoguing with the authors of texts and their instructors and, you know, making connections across texts. And um, it just lends itself to some really authentic discussions that, um, that were really important and valuable to have when we lost that face-to-face -face ability to connect. Um, it also allows us to be really nimble. Monica was talking about using hypothesis with um, OER, and we have found that that has been an invaluable tool for our instructors who are using open educational resources. Um, I myself, after the uh, shutdown kind of scratched what I was planning on doing for the rest of the semester and decided, you know, hey, we're going to look at the way um, the way the news coverage is really um, is really different, whether you're, you know, a, a sort of left leaning news source or a right leaning news source. And so, um, you know, we all wanted to be kind of glued to our phones and glued to social media to understand what was going on during the pandemic. And because Hypothesis is great about, how, you know, layering in memes and image and audio and news clips and videos, you know, students could really become active participants in going out and finding, you know, something going on in their community and bringing it back to the classroom for analysis and discussion and um, that became this really powerful way to kind of deal with digital literacy as students are really trying to grapple um, with you know just so much information um, and so uh, we've really loved hypothesis more and more people want to be involved um, all the time I, I ran a workshop yesterday and summer tends to be kind of a, a downtime for um usually technology trainers and we had tons of people show up and so um if you haven't used hypothesis it's definitely worth your time to check out and um i'm happy to answer questions if anybody has any hey kat thank you so much um that was great they got a lot of compliments on your slides in the chat i don't know if you saw that Thanks. but if you want to make sure i get them i can distribute them to everybody via email too for sure yeah um and hey, I know that uh, Veronica may have to go soon because she has another meeting and maybe other people do too. And we got a really great question teed up for Monica here. But I wanted to just check first to see if there was, were any questions for Veronica specifically in the Rutgers environment um, in case she needs to pop off and go to her other meeting. I think that was on the bingo card, wasn't it? I have a hard stop. Not seeing anything pop open. Well, maybe uh, this might be an interesting one for, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to say one thing about Veronica and the Rutgers use case that I thought was really powerful was just said, Veronica knew about the tool and brought it to some instructors um, and got some great active usage in, in her school communication at Rutgers. And one of the neat things that happened was, you know, word spread, others got interested. Um, and what started off as a pilot in the Rutgers School of Communication uh, partially uh, with an assist from COVID, um, ended up uh, as a pilot for the full Rutgers system. Um, and so it was just very encouraging for me to see how the grassroots interest in, in digital tools can percolate up. Um, and I basically, it's not a question I guess has come in, but thank you, Veronica, for you know, helping that happen. Well, thank you. It was really, it was really nice to work with you and helping us get set up because that the the integration was like the crucial thing and all of this and having that and having you help me um, work with my admins who had wanted nothing really to do with allowing an integration um, and having you kind of help me along so I could do it just for the school of communication information was really useful. You want to give them a plug for our OLC talk next week? Ah. <laughs> Well, that, that actually was another interesting thing um, with this is that, you know, working with vendors for me uh, comes naturally because I used to work in publishing, but I know um, a lot of my faculty are very, uh, how shall we say, um, not as friendly with the idea of vendors. They actually thought my predecessor was like getting a kickback from publishers for suggesting or, or vendors for suggesting them. And so when I knew this came up, I... I really pitches like we, you know, Hypothesis is a company that you can work with. That this isn't just your typical um, 
vendor uh, that shall rename nameless that's very um, <laughs> aggressive with their techniques and calling faculty to try and get them to use their polling software. But uh, they, you know, I got um, our associate dean on the phone with Jeremy because they were all skeptical about like, what's this other ed tech tool that you're trying to, you know, push at faculty? And I was like, no, it's really, it's not like that. And here is how I can show you because they are happy to have a phone call with you and talk about it. And that really seemed to pave the way for this and that this was not your normal vendor relationship, which then has been in part leading to me being invited to co-present with me and Jeremy next year or next week about the kind of that vendor uh, academic relationship and how they can be uh, positive ones and not necessarily always be on the academic side feeling like you're being sold or harassed by people. Yeah, we will share out information on that um, on that panel too. It's got a great title, Sympathy for the Vendor. Um, it's a metaphor that Jeremy came up with playing on the Rolling Stones song, um, <clears throat> for better or for worse. And uh, you'll actually, the schedule for all those things are on the blog post that you originally went to to sign up for this webinar, um, but we can also distribute uh, those to you again. You know, hey, before you have to run off to um, Veronica, there's a couple of questions here that I think would be really interesting to hear from, from everybody uh, from each school that's, that's part of the panel here. And maybe if you want to start, uh, Veronica, if you have a couple minutes. Um, one question uh, is around uh, <clears throat> um, any use that you've seen in the sciences or STEM fields um, and that whether you've had uh, traction there. So I support more of a professional school in the social sciences. So I don't have any experience with that. Um, so I, I really couldn't Sorry, can, can I pass on that one? Yeah, you can pass. Um, and maybe that's one that, uh, you know, Kat or Monica and Ben have something to add to. Um, yeah, I can jump in. I think uh, definitely I, I think our, at least our people who are initially attracted to hypothesis tended to be in the humanities or English and social science um, instructors. But uh, we have gotten uh, a, a lot of STEM folks interested, especially kind of after the shutdown as people, uh, a lot of our STEM faculty found themselves kind of lecturing to these black tiles on Zoom where you're kind of wondering like, are my, are my students there or are they not? And you know, they'd contact me and be like, well, how can I get my, um, how can I get my students, like, how do I know if they're paying attention or how do I, you know, they, I think face-to-face -face instructors were looking for that way to kind of connect to students. And um, some started using hypothesis and digital annotation to try to draw students in, um, whether that was, you know, looking, a lot of times pulling in some kind of current resource. So if it was looking at, you know, the way that the virus was spread or current thoughts about the vaccine and kind of connecting that to a, you know, biology class or, a, you know, and so you started to see some interesting ways that people were trying to, I think, people were leveraging hypothesis to show that their content was still relevant during a pandemic when suddenly it was hard for people to feel sometimes like their academic subject was super relevant. So um, that was really exciting. I can jump in to say that um, uh, ECAP is a Boise State, Monica and I are really interested in looking into how other disciplines outside of typically, typical disciplines to annotate their materials can leverage social annotation in their classrooms, especially online. Um, and one of the big things that is really great with um, hypothesis, but a lot of just social annotation in general, is that you can actually um, assign students paper, research papers to read or to go find resources and then um, comment on the resources they find on the web. And because of the way groups work, um, students can really kind of follow each other around the web or annotate a research paper together or really like dig through a lot of dense material that typically they would do outside of class and then come to class prepared for. Um, and in that way, social annotation provides kind of a new way to do instruction as far as um, having people collectively and closely read together, especially um, in STEM. And so, you know, a lot of uh, pre 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 preparatory courses um, in STEM could really use, you know, a, a guidance like 
um, a guided facilitated activity with reading closely, with research, with finding resources, and that really would help too. That's great. And I, we're, I know we want to get um, over to uh, the work we're going to do with Maha in a second, and maybe we even would want to stretch our legs or something. I don't know. But um, there is one other really juicy question here uh, that was teed up a little bit for, for you guys, Monica and Ben, but Kat might have a, something to weigh in on it too. And that's um, how uh, you manage to align hypothesis with uh, your institutional values there at Boise State. Because I um, can be, this is really near and dear to my heart too, because aligning tool usage with mich the mission of an institution seems like the very first step one would always want to take. So can you talk a little bit about your experience there? Sure. Um, so thank you for asking this question, whoever was that asked it. Um, I really appreciate it because um, we try to vet our technology carefully. Um, at eCampus, we don't have control over what the institution actually goes on to support, which can be tricky because we require different tools than the rest of our institution does for more in-person classes. Um, my role on our research team is dedicated to OER. That means my first and foremost goal is providing no cost um, resources for students. And so we did not do an LMS integration. Um, instead, we did um, hypothesis out in the open world um, and we've loved that usage. Um, it does add a little bit of legwork for the faculty, but what I appreciate about it is that it aligned with our values of meeting our students with tools they could go on to use throughout their career. Hypothesis is so powerful. I don't want them to lose access to that going on to the future. Um, and so our like our graduate programs are interested in using it because we can leverage that tool across any platform anywhere. Um, so that's kind of how it aligned. It was really important for us that it was a no cost integration of some sort um, because OER is where it's at for us um, and we're working on building our first C degrees. So um, that's kind of how we aligned it. That makes a lot of sense. Kat, did you go through a process like that at, at Diablo Valley? Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, sort of, I, I spoke to this a little bit earlier, but because the focus, I think, at a lot of the community colleges is so heavy on, you know, teaching and instruction, and because hypothesis is such a really a valuable teaching tool that allows instructors to be kind of more hands-on with students and support students, that was how we were able to to really sell it. Um, we, all, we also had a lot of people who on our campus who were using Hypothesis like in the wild on the open web um, who were excited about it and excited about the company and their mission statement which um, which, which made it you know easier uh, to kind of get some momentum there um, but um, I, I know like all of us you know, we're all hit with a lot of ed tech all the time. And I, I mean, I just, I see so much value in hypothesis that, um, you know, that it, it was in some ways just the product itself made it an easier sell. That makes sense. Well, I really wanna, uh, I wanna thank uh, all you guys and Veronica in absentia for, uh, for being here. It was really great to hear your from you guys. Um, thank you so much for coming and, and presenting today. Thanks for having us. Round of applause. Yay. <laughs> I'm sorry that we had to move this into the webinar mode because it's much less uh, sort of communal and interactive than I would want it to be. Um, like, uh, you know, I realize like you can't, y'all can't see all the other people are here, but there, there are 136 right now uh, fantastic people here, m many of whom I recognize, many of them who I don't. And I just want to thank you all uh, for coming. It's really, really great to have this kind of um, this kind of attention and outpouring for this kind of uh, work that we're doing at a time when I know you probably all attended way too many Zoom meetings and are really tired of sitting in front of your screen. So thank you for that. And the next section um, is going to be a hands-on activity. Uh, we're going to be using the annotation tool hypothesis um, to uh, read and discuss and annotate together uh, work by Martin Weller, one of the keynote speakers for 
uh, the OLC conference, the, the uh, conference that this workshop is part of. And Martin has joined us as a panelist. Hi, Martin. Hi, Jeremy. And um, so the way this is going to work um, is that uh, we are going to give you a link to Martin's uh, chapter from Martin's book. You will need a, a free hypothesis account to, to join this activity. You can, I think this is a live link right here uh, to, to go and create an account. Um, just click here and create an account. They're free. All you need is an email. You probably will need to confirm uh, your account via uh, your email. Um, and yeah, I can post that link in here in the chat or maybe one of my colleagues can, but I've got it right here. So go to get started there. You can ignore the part about the Chrome extension. You just need to do step one. Um, and uh, yeah, you're gonna experience the sort of collaborative knowledge building that's been described both as a classroom activity and as a professional development activity by our, our panelists. Um, there's more information that you need here, uh, but there's a, there's a lot of information on this slide. And again, you can get the deck. Maybe one of my colleagues um, can uh, drop in the, the deck link again, or it's actually in the upper right-hand corner of the, of the slide here. Um, and really just some basic introduction to how this kind of tool works. Um, you're gonna you can select text on any digital document on which a tool like Hypothesis is activated. In this case, you'll be using Hypothesis. So when Hypothesis is activated, which we're gonna do for you using magic, um, then uh, you can select text and annotate. You say something smart. You can also reply to another annotator um, and say something smart and also gracious uh, in response to somebody else's ideas. Um, or you can, of course, get into a little bit of disagreement. I love your description, Christine, of uh, Charles and you, uh, you know, having a, a conversation using the tool. Um, the reply feature really is the key to, to discussion, right, and to collaboration. Um, and we'll be uh, annotating as part of the public layer on this document, but we could also, you'll see, create private groups to do that. Um, and the, without further ado, this slide links to Martin's work. I'll go ahead and uh, grab the link. It is a magical link that if you follow it, uh, will automatically uh, activate Hypothesis for you through a proxy server. Um, so it is a link that goes to, to a version of Martin's uh, uh, work that has Hypothesis already on top of it. Um, did I drop that link in there correctly? Yep, it's back up there. Um, you can also activate Hypothesis in a browser extension inside the LMS. You don't need any of these things. It's uh, something that's activated uh, through the tool, through the application in the browser uh, in, the, in the LMS. But for now, anybody on this slide can just click on this link or click on the link in the chat and it's going to open up a PDF of Martin's chapter. And we can already see that there are 11 annotations here, right? I'm on top of a PDF. Open it up. Cogdog has been here. Um, Nate's been here. WTeach. So we have some existing annotations that we can engage with. Some of it, some Kurt, uh, uh, Curtis has used a, uh, a video, you can, that's extra points if you can use a video or an image, but I'm gonna stop talking and just let folks start to engage here and I'll pay attention to the chat as well my colleagues to help people get into this document. Um, but this is a collaborative annotation exercise. So I challenge you to get up and running with a hypothesis account. Join us here on the first chapter from 25 years of ed tech um, and start annotating. I'll just show you quickly what that looks like. I'll select text. Highlighting would be private. Annotation can be public or private. It's a very flexible bubble here. Lots of different things can happen in here. You can add images, video, yes, LaTeX, um, links to other documents, um, you can use tags. Uh, but for now, you know, I just encourage you to read Martin's work, to engage in Martin's work. He's gonna be giving the keynote next week, um, or maybe two weeks, a uh, week and a half from now. Um, uh, as part of the OLC conference, and this is your chance to start to engage with his ideas. He's a e-learning pioneer, been around uh, in the in this space for a while, has a lot to share from from his experience over the years. Um, and uh, yeah, let's engage with his work. I'll just point out one thing, which is you can see here this little red icon up here is an indicator to me that some, there's new annotations on the page, so I can click that and refresh. And if I sort of resort by newest. I'll see that uh, Curtis is the, new, the, the newest annotation. Looks like there's probably some, um, some replying going on. So I'm gonna let you loose and go into the chat 
Um, Martin is here. Hopefully Martin can engage with you. I was automatically logged in. You may have to log in when you, when you jump here. Um, but let's read and annotate uh, together. Martin, was there um, an, a first annotation that was like a fun type of thing that was going to happen first before people we let people loose on the entire document? I think Nate mentioned that in one of the emails. Just so people have a place to start. Uh, I don't think so, not as far as I know. I think it's just uh, everyone dive in. But, um, I resisted annotating my own documents. I thought <laughs> it's a bit like, <laughs> and, um, if you if you do online tutoring, you know, as soon as the tutor comes in and says something, it kind of shuts down all conversation and debates. <laughs> I should this annotated. Perhaps I should go in and say. I pretend like Martin's not even here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Although I'm he's taking not, he's names, not watching you annotate. You know, any, any rude comments. <laughs> but maybe if you say something really insightful, he will respond. Uh, and perhaps even in the next edition of the text, include your insights as a, as a revision. Yes, I like that idea, Edward. You could ask a question of Martin. Contextualize, ask me anything. So already at 16 annotations on the page, on the document. One neat thing that we can do as we're annotating here uh, that I might encourage some folks that are ready for the challenge would be to uh, use tags. Um, and you might look at what other kinds of tags other folks are using. Um, and uh, that would allow us, I, I, I think Alitza mentioned this, that would allow us to have different lenses on, Martin te on Martin's text. Uh, you know, sort of using the folksonomy uh, as, as certain themes arise or uh, they, we can then search the, uh, the annotation pane to get a vision of just that uh, particular layer of commentary.
Shout out to Kyle at Wake Forest for embedding a link here. There's a question in the chat about uh, tags. Um, and I'll just show real quickly the tag uh, bubble is right below the annotation bubble. You do have to press the carriage return or enter to make your tag save. So as the instructor of this de facto uh, uh, course that we're in here, I would just encourage folks to not only read the text, but also read each other's comments and engage with each other and use that reply function. I'm seeing a lot of top level annotations, which is great thankful for the engagement, but listen to each other as well and build, build knowledge with each other through the, through the reply and the discussion threads that can um, be created in that way. One neat thing that I've experienced just now is getting a, a message from Hypothesis telling me that Kyle has replied to one of my annotations, um, which is an experience that I always love getting that notification. Um, and uh, it brings me back to, I mean, it's also kind of meta because I'm actually responding to one of Kyle's annotations uh, here in the screen share. Um, and I get a message that Ramey replied to me. And so now I'm just jazzed, right? I'm like, oh, people are replying to me. I've got to go check my annotations, um, which I think in a, in a classroom, I mean, first of all, just as a intellectual, I'm so happy to have people rep rep replying to my ideas, uh, even if they might be saying I'm wrong, I have to go dive into it to see what they're saying. Um, but as a student, this is a way to bring your students back to the text, right? When they get replies they, from you or from their classmates, they may be um, inspired to go back to the text uh, and hopefully, you know, return to rethinking about the text and rethinking their own ideas or building on their ideas. So that's just one of the great ways that I think um, annotation, whether uh, for scholastic or scholarly practice, you know, has us re-engaging with texts and re-engaging with our own ideas and engaging with others um, in the sort of fluid way that through knowledge, the way knowledge is produced. I will note that you can also create page notes. Page notes are uh, annotations that attach to the to the document as a whole, rather than a specific um, a specific piece of the text.
I wonder how hard it would be to get an image of of Telio or uh, Telo or or Bruno in in, in here, Martin. <laughs> I remember I, when I used to be on Instagram. I remember seeing your your dog walks quite often. We can, uh, Susan, drop the link uh, in again. Um, you should be able to just grab this link right here from the Historical Amnesia of EdTech, and it should have the ability to uh, not only take you to Martin's chapter, but also with annotation on top of it. I'm going to go ahead and surface some of the questions in the Q&A for folks as you're working. Um, Lucia asks if any clinical psychology, social work, human services educators are with us today. I, I don't know uh, in terms of the participant list if there are, but I can tell you that um, Ann Oberman at uh, Metropolitan State University in Denver um, is in social work and has, uh, mar has uh, mobilized many in her department um, to use hypothesis in the context of social work education. Uh, in some really powerful ways. We actually have a link to a presentation she gave at, uh, I believe at OLC in Denver, um, maybe last year or the year before, um, uh, that where she talks about that, but she's also a very generous uh, scholar and uh, colleague and, and I'm sure would be interested in connecting. In fact, I just connected her with an educator at, uh, at Boise State, also in, um, in social work. So anonymous attendee, uh, what are the steps involved in uploading this book as a PDF? Um, so the, there's a few steps there. One, right is the permission of Martin, I believe. I'm not the one that did this, but I imagine we got permission from Martin and hopefully his publisher to, to host it in this way. It's a small selection of a larger book. Uh, go buy it somewhere at your local bookstore or uh, online retailer. Um, but uh, this is hosted actually through our doc drop um, prototype, which allows you to drop in a PDF and it will OCR it and add uh, hypothesis to it. Um, you can also uh, annotate on PDFs that are locally stored. Um, and you can also obviously host uh, uh, PDFs uh, online in different ways and uh, in other ways and also host them within a, the context of the LMS, uh, which would allow you to do the same thing that we're doing here. So I could upload Martin's chapter uh, to a Canvas course, for example, and have students annotate there. Um, but if you go to docdrop.org, you'll see an interface that allows you to drop a PDF in there um, and then host it. But uh, you want to do that with something that you have permission.
one interesting thing in, ter in terms of how Hypothesis works is that normally on a web page, we're triangulating users and their annotations on top of content uh, via the URL. Um, but with PDFs, there's a unique fingerprint in every PDF that would allow that allows us to bring users together on top of that specific document. So uh, if you were to download and then uh, yeah, maybe you have a colleague that you really want to read this article, uh, you could download this uh, PDF and, and email it to them. Um, and if they brought it into the browser, they could annotate and they'd see all the annotations that, that we've created because there's a unique fingerprint to this particular PDF so that, um, of course, we can return to it later and we can share it with others. Sorry, Jeremy, just to add a few people asking about the book. I should yeah. stress it's uh, openly published with Athabasca University Press. Um, and I stuck a link in there, but perhaps we can stick it in later as well. So you can just go and download the original PDF as well if you want. Um, and reuse it as you like. So we should just send you checks directly then? That's right. Okay. I take payment in beer or coffee or tea, anyways. All right, you can, fair enough. You can buy the physical copy for me. Feel free to do that. But I'm just saying, if you want to get the, the sort of unannotated version, you can just download it. Great, good to know. So that's in the in the chat. Ariella, an image does need a URL. Um, we're never hosting the the the, the content itself, uh, whether you know PDFs or web pages. They're they're hosted at the source. I think that's one of the um, unique things about Hypothesis as a collaborative annotation tool. Um, there are other technologies that should be said, and, and we really want to foreground that here. It's nice to hear the praise for Hypothesis, but um, there are other technologies that allow for collaborative annotation, collaborative reading. Um, but one of the unique things about Hypothesis is that it is not a platform that ingests uh, content and, and re-hosts content. Um, it is a tool that is brought with individuals as they um, move around the web. Um, in LMS, on web pages, on PDFs, move around different digital uh, documents, you know, through the internet. Um, and that makes us uh, a little more versatile, a little more copyright friendly, um, but ultimately really uh, user friendly in the sense that the, the, the user sort of owns the technology and the annotations um, as opposed to being dependent on a, on a platform to, to host and, and present everything. That was a philosophical way of answering Ariella that images do need to already be hosted online um, and do require a URL in terms of adding them to, uh, to, the, to an annotation. You can drop a YouTube video in. I think somebody already did that. Anonymous attendee, we're, we have image and video annotation in our long-term roadmap, but currently right now we're just annotating on top of text. So we're up to 67 annotations here. Got some nice threads going. Oh, great one, Ferris Bueller. Thanks to Alan Levine, who looks like he was here uh, I suppose, I don't even know if, that's one of the interesting things to point out. I don't know that we asked uh, Alan to, uh, to annotate as part of uh, this exercise. Uh, he was annotating here over a week ago. Um, and that might just be because of, again, the sort of triangulation on the PDF that he chose to do the annotation, uh, you know, annotate this text as part of his practice, um, you know, his intellectual practice online. Um, and his annotations were already here, not as part of our activity, but just because um, 
they were made as public annotations on top of this document, which we recognize as, uh, you know, through the PDF as a uh, unique uh, object. You can annotate in private groups. These are some of my private groups. Um, so right now we're all annotating the public, but if we had chosen to annotate as part of a private group, we could have created one uh, and shared the link and all joined a private group. <clears throat> yes, GIFs. I think I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Nate, who may have more to say about the exercise we're engaged in here and, and, uh, and thoughts about how to, uh, to work with us, uh, work with this text today. Um, and I'll, I'll focus on it. If Nate, you're, I think you're on. Uh, if you want to take over, you, you can. And I will uh, uh, try to answer some of these questions in the, in the, in the uh, Q&A. I am here. Thank you, Jeremy. Wow, what a lot of activity is going on. I'm just uh, getting a handle on it now. Nate, are you on mute? I'm not saying anything quite yet, Franny. Oh, okay. Hi, good morning. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Yeah, I'm just starting to get a handle on uh, what folks have done here. So many great annotations happening. One thing that I um, have you guys already taken a look at um, what these annotations would look like uh, if we put them into crowd layers to see the statistics on what's happened so far. We have not done that yet. I was just about to do that. You want to introduce crowd layers and I'll uh, Since I'm sharing, get it up. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> and have you talked about analytics at all yet? No. Okay, great. Well, one of the things that um, <clears throat> we're sort of most excited about right now is um, all the different things that are beginning to happen with analytics uh, on top of on top of annotation, because you know, as you probably discussed already, you know, the way in which annotation enables reading to start to become a, a visible active practice that, um, you know, in addition to being uh, social, it is also something that we can, we can look at as a kind of um, activity that happens over time. Um, so what, one of the nice things about hypothesis having an open API is that other, <clears throat> other projects can kind of make use of that and um, tie into hypothesis to um, kind of uh, add extra pieces of functionality on top of it. And so one of those projects is Crowd Layers, which is a joint project of a couple of educators um, in Colorado, University of Colorado. In fact, uh, they might even be here. I'm not sure if Remy Collier or Francisco are here. Don't see them in the list. Uh, so they have created this um, <clears throat> utility called crowd layers that is um, a, uh, a kind of standalone analytics engine that you can point uh, 
to uh, some annotations that happen on hypothesis. You can see that Jeremy's doing in the background right now. Basically, you can plug in either a document URL like Jeremy has done or even a group and you can start to see all the different uh, kind of activity, annotation activity that's happened on top of that document. So in this case, you can see that we've got um, 131 annotations so far, 48 different participants on top of this one document. 26 threads, um, the annotations have happened over four days. Um, 27 different tags have been used. And you can see that it, <clears throat> in addition to listing out the, the annotations itself, if you scroll down a little bit, Jeremy, you can see in this participants graph, um, you can start to see a map of um, the activity that each different participant has done. And so that breaks it down into both annotations and replies. Uh, so each little bar graph there, each little uh, column on the bar graph is a different, a different annotator. And uh, it breaks it down between the, the actual kind of root annotations and the replies that they made. So you can see certain people have been uh, much more into replying and some people have been making a lot of root annotations in some of the mix. Uh, and then you can actually, like uh, in the thread section, that's a little bit even further down, you can actually dive down into particular threads. And so if you um, highlight one of those columns, you can actually use it as a navigation tool to um, just surface uh, either the threads or the, the other bar graph that you're on now, Jeremy, it's the tags. <clears throat> and so then if you, uh, went back up to the top, you would see um, you would see uh, the annotations that would be highlighted up there would be just the ones in a particular thread or a particular tag. So it's a kind of way of navigating through and and seeing. Uh, so that is just uh, just the annotations in a particular. I, I didn't see if you click on a tag or a thread there. Um, but you've then it's a thread yeah it's a thread right so you've isolated it to one thread that has uh, five different participants in it as you can see there Jeremy as well as a couple of other folks and so at Hypothesis we've also been um, <clears throat> we've also been working with analytics quite a bit um, in a way to start to explore um, what you might uh, what you might look at in terms of all the activity that's going on and how that might be helpful either from uh, the perspective of an individual assignment, um, what a teacher might be interested in in terms of the class as a whole, um, what the class activity might look like over time, um, and what uh, activity at a whole institution might look like, and we're um, working with the different organizations that are actively piloting right now to explore uh, all the different kinds of analytics that could be um, sort of derived from this work and, uh, and start to uh, pinpoint which ones would be actually most useful um, for educators as they're, as they're kind of pursuing their practice. And there's just so many different um, kind of angles of analytics that could come out of it. So for instance, on a particular document, right, there might be hot spots, right? Like particular areas in the document itself that have gotten a lot of annotation activity. And that might mean either that, um, you know, people are finding the material in that particular section to be very compelling, or it might be that that particular area is actually causing some difficulty in understanding. And it might be an area where, um, you know, the class needs to spend more time and more focus because so many people have focused their, their annotation and their reading on that one section. Um, there are patterns that you can see uh, in people asking questions through annotation. Uh, there, are, there are patterns that you can see that come out of the ratio of annotations versus replies. Um, there's all sorts of kinds of um, deeper levels of information that can be elicited. And so what we're trying to do is work with work with educators who are active uh, in this field to identify what kinds of analytics are actually going to be useful for them in per actually pursuing, uh, pursuing their course goals. 
So in, um, I know in my slides, Jeremy, uh, there's a, there is one slide where I had brought together some, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a little bit further on here. I'd brought together some screenshots. There we go. Um, from, you can see crowd layers on the top there, <clears throat> but I brought together some screenshots of some of the different kinds of um, analytics that we're pulling out of, out of, uh, out of the work that's going on today. <clears throat> and, and so I know this, this is a little bit abstract. I didn't want to violate anybody's privacy or anything, but um, the, uh, the in, right in the center of the slide and a little bit to the left where there's those uh, sort of um, black <laughs> uh, kind of linear graphs, right? There's kind of inky lines going across that shows um, activity across multiple different institutions over time. And uh, on the left, you have last fall semester, and then on the right, you have in the spring semester. And so you can start to see like all the annotation activity across an entire institution. Um, that's for a full academic year, really. And so you can start to see, you know, some people hadn't even started using annotation until the spring, and so their activity ramped up in the spring. Some people did some in the fall and more in the spring and vice versa. So you can imagine the same kind of um, information, not only for across schools, but across different classes in one institution, right? Like where is the reading activity happening vibrantly and what classes in our institution? And then on the right, you see this sort of um, a bunch of different tiny bar graphs that you can all, we can't really read, that's really kind of an overview of a school itself. So the you know, number of different class groups that are formed, the amount of annotations per day, how many students are actively annotating per day. And then across the bottom is this idea of uh, a little bit like we were looking at in crowd layers as, you know, in one particular class, when you start to graph the activity of particular students or individuals in those classes, what does it look like? And this is something that can is, um, of course, interesting at the meta level, but it's also interesting um, when you dive down into just the single humans practice, right? And you start to think about assessment and individual students engagement with texts. Right, you can start to see patterns in how people are interacting with the text. Uh, and you can either use that in an assessment context or just in a context of understanding how deep their engagement is with the reading material. I know uh, Jeremy's uh, busy answering questions right and left there. Yeah, so I know, um, Virginia, I'm just uh, addressing the questions that have to do with, uh, with analytics specifically. So Virginia said, who has access to this dashboard? So the one that we've shown off in CrowdLayers, right, it's a public service uh, that the CrowdLayers team has made, has made uh, visible. So um, <clears throat> you can, anyone can use it to view public annotations, annotations that are made publicly into any document. Um, but uh, if you actually are the member of a private group, you can go to CrowdLayers and use it as a way to plug into activity that uh, is happening in the context of your private group. The other analytics dashboards that um, we've just given you a kind of preview of are actually um, derived out of um, work that's happening in the context of learning management system integrations. And so it's a much more kind of locked down private set of activity. And so that's um, analytics work that's only visible to uh, people that are working, uh, institutions that are working closely with Hypothesis and starting to explore this sort of beta capabilities around analytics. So um, when you ask who, who has access to the dashboard, can you see the threads? Um, if you're asking specifically about the crowd layers interface, it's a little, it takes a little bit of getting used to the interaction because if you, there's that area that like Jeremy has on his screen right now of annotations. 
and that area is showing the annotations for whatever he has highlighted at the time. And so right now he has the entire document highlighted. So all 144 annotations are somewhere in that list. But if he went down to see us now and highlighted just um, a particular participant, you can see that the list of annotations in the dashboard actually changes to be filtered just on that one, that one participant. And you could do, do the same thing with in this case, it's, it's Rebecca Frost Davis <laughs> um, on a repellent. Uh, you can do, do the same thing with a particular thread or a particular tag. And so that list of uh, annotations up at the top changes based on um, sort of what part of the, the rest of the, the graph you're interacting with. I'm just uh, trying to catch up here and what's happening with some of the um, the questions. I was just showing their live how to search the sidebar. Um, I can sort of hone in on a user or a tag or even some free form, you know, concept um, and use this search, this little magnifying glass to search so I can see all of Rebecca's uh, annotations uh, as once all 14 of hers, or I can uh, search a term and see all annotations that reference that term. If there were consistent use of tags, I'd be able to surface all tags of a, a certain, with a certain, <coughs> of a certain type, um, which, you know, offers another lens to the text. I notice also in the chat, um, Haley uh, has asked uh, about the, the chat functionality in Zoom you should be able to change who you're addressing in your chat. Um, do we have it set so it's locked down to only communicate with the panelists? Yeah, I think it is because it's webinar. Because that's the only know. option I'm seeing. There should oh, no, be there a, is an all panelists I mean, attending it's like privately or with all panelists. Are there, you know what, I just, um, I just, I just changed the setting. Um, uh, My apologies for that. Uh, so um, there's a little blue drop down menu um, that indicates who you're, uh, who you're able to chat with. <laughs> uh, and you can now switch that to be um, all panelists and attendees, for example. There, Haley's got it. Yay. Sorry about that. I feel like every time Zoom updates, I have to relearn some of the interface. Thanks, George, that's so true. So late in the game to have made that change. Yeah, there's been vibrant conversation with just the panelists. Yeah, my apologies because we didn't want to do that by, um, we didn't want to have that set up by default. Uh, we wanted we wanted the possibility for everyone to communicate with everyone, um, and obviously it would be great if people could voice with each other too. But with you know, uh, like a hundred people here or whatever, it's uh, it's a little bit hard to do that. So chat is the, is the best we got. So Haley is finally able to pose the question to to everyone. <laughs> uh, looking for other instruction librarians? Yes. Yeah, the librarian community is a rich one uh, within annotation. We see, of course, a lot of um, a lot of traction with um, with instructors and teachers of different kinds. Um, but uh, because librarians are so often asked to help people, um, you know, uh, with different kinds of 
engagement with on top of text and with kind of digital literacy efforts, which annotation can play a role in. Um, there's a pretty vibrant uh, librarian community as well. Helen has called out. Great to see. Uh, great to see you both here. Are there any other librarians in the crowd who want to um, shout out to the crowd and identify, identify the self-identify as librarians? Another librarian, Edward. Greetings. Nice to see you. So Nate and Jeremy, I don't know if you answered this earlier, but one of the questions in the Q and A panel asked if there's a way for students to um, archive their annotations, like from one class to the next or something like that. Export well, them. <clears throat> Let me show you uh, what I'm showing on my screen right now. It's always a little risky to do this. Is my uh, my personal portfolio of annotations, right? Places I've annotated. So you can see that uh, my last two annotations were on the doc that we're all looking at. Um, but you can also see what I've been annotating recently, um, some California Community College <laughs> Chancellor's Office documents, uh, why is Zoom so exhausting at the Chronicle of Higher Education. But this is all 5,000 plus of my annotations over the past seven years. Um, and you can see tags, my top tags as well. So this is my sort of personal portfolio of annotations. Right now you're seeing annotations that are mined through my uh, logged in account. So this would include um, things that, uh, that um, I've annotated privately. And just because my boss is on the line, I did want to let you know, I, I'm not actually looking for a job at Home Depot, Dan, um, as project manager, senior manager. This was a exercise with a, a, a class that was in a business school trying to uh, annotate LinkedIn uh, portfolios or you know uh, job listings as part of their um, professional development. Um, but I can also search by, uh, by tags. So I can see all annotations by me, tag digital humanities. And so this is also obviously something a student can do um, with their, look at their annotations across time. I can look at all annotations, tag Jeremy Dean, digital humanities and MLA. Uh, so I can do different things. And I can also look at the broader feed of all public annotations. Uh, you know, this is what's happening over the past seven days, right? You can obviously see there's 65 annotations. We're up there, right? But there's, um, translation of Naomi Klein being annotated, um, stuff in, in Latin, it looks like. This is all public annotation stuff about COVID. Um, and I can search here for a user. I could see all of Rebecca Frost Davis's annotations that are public. Um, I could search for a tag. Uh, I don't know what will happen if I do this. Uh, this is all tag, wow. A lot of tags of COVID-19, uh, that's interesting. Um, so this is where annotations, public annotations or annotations that one has access to privately or through a group can be searched and are archived. Um, and you can see they're attached to a document that, it, you know, this, this uh, pub factory document, um, they're attached to a user and they're attached to a, P a referent. Uh, there was a question about uh, printing annotations on PDFs, you know, the dynamism of what we're doing threaded conversation on top of a document online is not something that can just be printed. Uh, you can export your annotations and the metadata surrounding them, um, you know, the, the time they were made, the document they were made on, uh, the referent in the original text that they're attached to, things like that, but they're not gonna be in context uh, in a printable version or an exportable version, except that you can, of course, uh, reopen a website or reopen a PDF and, and see the, the, the annotations in context. Um, I will note that this is not currently possible with LMS integration. The LMS integration is uh, really focused on a document uh, in context view, but we are going to bring this sort of activity board um, to the view uh, within the LMS so the student would indeed be able to see their annotations across a course, across documents, across multiple courses, and hopefully eventually be able to take those annotations with them uh, in one form or another when they leave a formal educational institution in which they were introduced to hypothesis. Um, there were some questions about that and there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, anonymous attendee asks, if a student leaves the college and no longer has access to the LMS, um, would the hypothesis session have to be public in order for previous students to view their work? Um, yeah, the, you, you, you currently when you leave St. Edwards, you're not gonna have access to your annotations. They are archived, they are, you know, they are attached to documents and they are stored, 
Um, but right now, since Rebecca students logged in through Canvas, um, there's no way for them to, you know, log back into that hypothesis account and see those annotations uh, in, in a context. But essentially the architecture is there to eventually allow that student from uh, Rebecca's class to maybe at a new institution, open that article from JSTOR and hypothesis will recognize it, will recognize them and be able to present their annotations to them again. So they exist, they're just not uh, easily visible. Um, I have heard of some schools leaving access to courses in LMSs open to students so that they can go back to that content. Um, and then I know, of course, other, course, uh, other schools that shut it down as soon as a student uh, leaves, you know, finishes the course. I haven't done this in a long time, but I really love looking at the sort of public fire hose of what's being annotated, right? Um, different languages, different types of content. Um, stuff at the Washington Post, all kinds of interesting documents being annotated publicly uh, using hypothesis. Managing your warehouse, for example. Open access transformation, something in German. Model-based construction of collaborative systems, such diverse topics and areas. Back to you in Portland, Nate. So there was just a vibrant um, chat conversation starting around um, keyboard campaign, uh, keyboard <laughs> commands, sorry. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that uh, we've been highly focused on accessibility lately, um, and one of our, uh, one of the things we've come to learn in our journey through accessibility is the degree to which when you address accessibility in general, you end up um, making uh, uh, the capabilities or a tool more useful for everyone, easier to use for everyone. And so uh, one of the outcomes, for instance, of um, focusing on accessibility has been to standardize and regularize the keyboard commands that are possible with annotation, um, first of all, so they can form with the kind of standards that are out there, and also so they can be they can be used um, by people with any range of abilities to uh, more quickly or more easily navigate through a document. Just uh, recently. Um, had an outside accessibility review <clears throat> by the um, Inclusive Design Research Center um, up in Toronto, um, which uh, confirmed that we've reached uh, WCAG AA 2.0 status. Um, and I'll put the link into the, the chat there. Um, And as you all know, if you're accessibility, <laughs> accessibility fans is that um, you know, accessibility is a, is a never ending ongoing kind of um, sort of orientation to the world, making sure that uh, a tool is accessible and inclusive for all users. So we're, we're very happy to, to reach this milestone in, in the accessibility journey, but uh, we also know that that's just the start of what's going on. <clears throat> if you're interested in uh, the kind of full accessibility picture too, you might also look at uh, our overall page on accessibility that kind of talks about how we approach it and what our current status is. There's a VPAT there with the current accessibility of the tool uh, and talks about what the next steps that we're gonna be uh, moving into are. So uh, Jeremy, I don't know if you know any, uh, anything about this, uh, but Debbie has asked about um, studies that we may know about that uh, consider digital annotation tools and the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. 
as in cognitive load. Um, I don't know of anything specifically about that. Do you, Jeremy? I don't know of anything specifically, but I think Ramey um, and some of the folks in the chat that are uh, on the call would might be able to. Uh, Ramey is here. I see that now. Okay, great. Another thing that we've um, started to do as part of the, um, the kind of collaborative work <clears throat> across annotate ed is gather together the research into a common a common place so that um, we're able to um, identify it and see it together. And I'm just sticking that up now, but um, we've been bringing together uh, a bibliography of research on annotation in a uh, collaborative bibliography tool uh, called Zotero. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, I'm just looking for the link now. One question I wanted to surface that I, I feel like uh, my colleague Michael has answered before that's uh, one that we've been getting a lot lately and I don't know that I have the best, uh, best answer for is from Danielle at Temple. Hi, Danielle. Um, are there any problems accessing hypothesis from certain countries? For instance, when we transitioned online this spring, I had students return home to Brazil and Taiwan who had difficulty accessing websites like VoiceThread and Zoom. Definitely know we've gotten this question. I, I believe uh, the answer is that hypothesis has largely been accessible in other countries. Um, I know we were working with some students in China, but Michael, if you could respond to that in the chat if you're still on. And I don't know about China, but it has been accessible from uh, uh, Armenia and uh, Eastern Europe. So, uh, and I also, my students have really enjoyed the different functionalities uh, related to the alphabets. They could also use in hypothesis, uh, Cyrillic and uh, Armenian alphabet as well. Rebecca, would you want to say more about this uh, work you've been having your uh, students do with Zotero and Hypothesis? Oh, I haven't had them been doing them together. I've had ah. assignments both ways, just noting that it was easier to get them started with a hypothesis than Zotero. I've had to scaffold more. Um, yeah, I, they have I been guess. Doing annotations. What were you saying about, I, but I just, I was annotating, so I only copied <laughs> your statement. Sure. What have you guys been doing with Zotero? Well, there's actually been a couple of different things with Zotero. Um, our colleague, John Udell, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if John's here as well. Uh, he's, it doesn't look like he is. Um, He's done some experiments on uh, ways to kind of um, have the two tools talk to each other. Um, uh, and I could link you to some experiments there um, because you, you can imagine as, I mean, this is probably maybe what you're getting at Rebecca, where uh, the utility of, um, you know, when you're making a, a bibliographic record like in Zotero, um, and you might want to attach that to a series of annotations on the same document. Right. And so Tarot does have a built-in kind of note-taking capability as well. It's not exactly the same as annotation. Um, yeah, I mean, it's got annotation, but you're really just kind of keeping notes for yourself and they're not on the text. Right, yeah, they're not anchored in the text, right, right. in the same way that Hypothesis is. And at the same time, Hypothesis doesn't have any kind of formal bibliographic or citation capability built into it the way that Zotero offers. So there's there is a nice kind of, um, uh, you know, sort of a, a marriage between the two could be a really powerful and interesting combination. It's so like John. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's like turning your research notebook inside out. Instead of putting all your citations and your notes in your notebook, you turn the web into your notebook and you put your stuff out there. Yeah, that's actually when I first uh, started to get interested in hypothesis. That's actually how I thought about it. it was as a kind of research notebook that I carried with myself and maintained for myself and then brought to whatever documents or research I was doing across across the web. Um, uh, 
And of course, you know, if you're going to be a formal researcher, having that kind of formal bibliographic reference capabilities that something like Zotero offers is key to that as well. Um, <clears throat> and so you have to then ask the question, like, you know, which which tool is the parent? You know, do I want do I want to have Zotero be the king of my list of references, and then have you know have it link to or copy the annotations that happen in Hypothesis? Or vice versa, do I want my annotations in Hypothesis to always refer back to, you know, a Zotero record or something like that? Um, and so there's there's still people exploring the different kinds of relationships the two systems mm -hmm. might have, um, and whether you know whether uh, I think John's tool enables you to import uh, Hypothesis annotations as Zotero notes into Z Zotero. Mm -hmm. um, which isn't, that isn't actually what I would, that wouldn't follow my practice because I would actually want to keep my, I mean, it doesn't take the notes away from hypothesis. Of course, they're still there. Like Jeremy was saying there, the, the annotations always continue to exist inside the, the hypothesis database. Right. Um, but uh, <clears throat> for people that are, uh, would w maybe in the course of their research writing or something would really want to see their notes attached to Zotero records so if they had them all in one place attached to the bibliographic record that you might be that, a model you know how you can get that right you can get a link to share your hypothesis can you get a link i might be thinking right a tool like to share here's the annotated version of this hypot this page with hypothesis i used to be able to do that with digo and um, yeah I, and so if it would just pull that if there was some way that it could automatically harvest that link, it's more like when I'm in my Zotero, I want to know, oh, do I have, you know, I can see that I have notes in Zotero. If I could also somehow indicate, oh, you have notes on a hypothesis, so you could go check them in case I forgot that I took notes somewhere. Yeah, um, let me just point out by way of sort of circling up here. I think we're done at the top of the hour, right, Nate? Yeah, um, so this, let me just make one last point here is that, you know, the conversation can continue here. Um, this is a link at the top. I grabbed it by pressing this little arrow um, and I can grab the, a copy of this uh, document plus the annotations and share it with a friend or a colleague. So you can actually share this, you know, uh, document. I'm sure you're all engrossed in, in Martin's uh, thinking here and, and have other colleagues that might enjoy it. So you can go ahead and share it and say, hey, why don't you annotate with me in this community I've been working on. Another really neat thing about Hypothesis is that you can share a specific annotation. Um, so this is also a link to this specific annotation. And with these links, um, somebody who doesn't know what Hypothesis is uh, will be able to open the text, uh, see the annotations, and if they create an account, then they can uh, reply and, and create their own annotations. But you can share this annotated document with anybody um, who has access to the web and they'll be able to open it up and, and see what we've done here today. So thank you all for coming. We'll hang out here for a while and we'll kind of be active in the chat and so forth in case anybody has any lingering questions. But if, if not, uh, we really appreciate your coming. And I really want to thank uh, all our panelists uh, for coming. Uh, Rebecca, Amitza, Charles, and is Christine, uh, Christine still here? Jeremy and Franny, also many thanks to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. I hope you guys record the second session so we can watch it because uh, our time difference is severe. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine. Yeah, what time is it there, Alitza? <laughs> it's seven o'clock right now in the evening. It's not that bad, but um, I don't, I, it's Friday night. I don't know that I can stay up that late. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. It looks like you're in like a gigantic auditorium all by yourself. <laughs> yes, <laughs> pretty lonely <laughs> here. <laughs> so That's a real room. It is. It's uh, where the Communist Party used to meet, actually. And this is part of our university building right now. So. <laughs> oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's found a lot of history around here. So, <laughs> so cool. Yeah. I can imagine. Well, it looks like you're doing a good job of social distancing since no one is within <laughs> a couple of miles. Yes. Of <laughs> I am populating, I was going to say this, all this, uh, you know, all the students that are missing here, they are present on Hypothesis. So, there. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. So nice to meet you. Very nice meeting you. I really appreciate your Thank coming. You. I, know, I know it was, it was a bit of a struggle for you all the way from Armenia. So. So um, I still see that there are a couple of um, questions in the chat. Uh, John, I see your question about partici participation being identified as Blackboard gradable exercise. Thanks to the uh, 
gradebook integration that we've done that actually um, goes across any of uh, any of the LMSs that are that are uh, you know are able to use LTI based tools um, like Hypothesis. Um, Blackboard has gradebook intervent, uh, integration just like the other LMSs, and so um, you can uh, make annotated documents and annotation around documents into a gradable exercise um, that would appear in the Blackboard gradebook as well. I don't know if that answered your question, John. Yes, I see that. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I can link you to um, a blog post about uh, about that integration, but the real, the real, if you, if you do want to try to move forward with LMS integration, I don't know if you, do you already, John, do you already have an integration with Blackboard and Hypothesis at your institution? Because if not, that the first step is, uh, it can only happen in the context of that LTI tool. If you haven't started the conversation yet, uh, here's the, here's the link to the Post announcing uh, back in November 2019 when we extended gradebook integration to all the um, all the LTI compliant uh, LMS as we had started with Canvas and then moved on to the others. Uh, so <clears throat> last fall we we announced that gradebook integration with all of them. If anyone is interested in um, actually beginning the conversation about getting the LMS integration going at their school, I just put that. That second link I just put in takes you to a place where you can uh, sign up to start the process to talk about integration with your LMS at your school. Thanks, John. Have a great day. I see uh, George Station has already left, but he had asked a question about uh, if there's a point where public annotations overwhelm the social aspect or engagement. How many is too many? That is a that is a really good question. There is a time when a document can become sort of oversaturated. And I know there was some conversation about this in the chat. The use of private groups uh, for annotation can be one way around that because in the context of a private group, right, you're only seeing the annotations for that group. And so it sort of limits the amount of, uh, the amount of annotation noise, if you will, on a particular document just into that group, group's container. Obviously the public layer is there as well if you're annotating out in the wild. In the context of the LMS integration, all the annotation happens in the context of a private group. And so each you know, course section or course uh, shell, sorry, inside an LMS kind of creates a private annotation group for the roster for that course. And those folks are annotating together. We just uh, rolled out for Canvas the ability to also enable sectioning capabilities so that the annotation groups can match uh, the sections that are available in an LMS like Canvas. We did Canvas first because it was easiest to do there and we wanted to make sure that we got it right in one LMS before we rolled it out to the others. But one of our next steps will be to roll out that kind of section support to other LMSs as well. And so getting back to George's question, you know, the public layer can become a sort of fire hose of annotation that on a, on a very closely read and popular document can get to be too much but that's where the grouping capabilities come in, either in the context of private groups out in the wild or in, in the context of an LMS. Just for the record, I'll link you to a very recent blog post about supporting that sections capability first with Canvas. I've got a slide up here that's um, a little bit about um, how to get prepared to do some annotation yourself. Because one thing that we wanted to do in this, um, in this workshop was stay away from kind of the pesky technical details and like, you know, how do you actually do an integration in Blackboard and that kind of stuff. That stuff is important and we would love to work with anybody who wants to work on that. But we really, the way we think about OLC Innovate is a chance for us as professionals to get together and actually develop our own practices and our own thinking, right? And so that's why we um, decided to make this workshop focus on, um, on uh, things that were related to the conference themselves, like the like Maha and Martin Weller's session that was in the morning. And so we asked Maha and Martin to each pick out a particular text that they thought was particularly re relevant and might be interesting to annotate together. And so the next thing that we're going to do 
is spend some time uh, annotating together, just like we were with the students um, on a text um, after a little, uh, a little, uh, Maha's gonna kind of set it up for us. But um, if you wanna, if you don't already have a hypothesis account for use uh, in the wild, so to speak, um, you can take a few minutes now to go ahead and make one. Um, there are directions here on this slide and I'm gonna put in a link uh, in chat to the page that this comes from um, so that you can uh, go to it directly. That link takes you to a page that has uh, the same information on it that I was just showing in that slide. And um, you can follow the directions there to get yourself set up with a hypothesis account um, and kind of get oriented toward the idea of doing some annotation because that's the very next thing we're gonna do. So if you don't already have um, hypothesis account set up for yourself, now would be a great time to think about doing it um, as, we, uh, as we kick it over to Maha and, and have her start to talk about why she's here, why she was willing to do this, uh, even though it's already uh, late in the evening for her. So um, Maha, welcome. Hi, thanks Nate for having me. Uh, and thanks everyone for, for joining. There's a great group of people here. Um, and the reason I jumped into this, I sort of, I think I sort of imposed myself <laughs> into this. What I was thinking about is, um, I've done a lot of uh, virtual conference presentations in situations where uh, there were other things going on, but right now, um, imagining doing a keynote at a conference and then not necessarily having a chance to talk to people before and after well, that felt wrong to me. Hold on, I'm in the middle of something. Um, so I was thinking that, you know, scholarship is a conversation and it shouldn't be, I come in, give a half hour keynote and then I'm gone. And so my keynote is actually in three parts. Um, one part has already taken place on Twitter. So if you've been following that thread, uh, that's, that's a third of my keynote. Another part of my keynote relates to the article that I wrote and I was planning to extend it beyond what was there. And this is actually your opportunity to be part of that. So this article, this article about literacy teachers needs uh, during the times of COVID-19 came out because oh I feel like um, people, you know, especially administrators expected that all that's needed is technology and digital skills. And I think there's much more needed than that. And I loved what um, Monica, Ben, and Kat uh, were talking about, you know, in terms of supporting students and in terms of the inequalities and how to create inclusive learning experiences. And that needs a different mindset than the mindset of let's help people use uh, the learning management system, right? Um, and then there was also a beautiful thread by Lise Keller of the set on Twitter. I don't know if anyone's seen that one. She was talking about how the discourse of online learning being bad and it's not the same as face to face and how you know, as, as faculty, we sort of have the responsibility to try to make it a good experience for students, even though we don't know yet, not us, but you know, people who don't work in online learning don't know yet how to do it. They don't know how to express emotion online and things like that. What happens is when I go to my article, which hopefully some of you will be willing to read right now and annotate, is that I think it might be really useful for people to say in their own context how they implement these literacies that I'm talking about. Um, so that's what I'm hoping you'll do today. So I'm hoping you'll do three things, just whichever of these three things makes sense to you. There's part of it where I talk about online third spaces or third places that are like a cafe that we need online, especially with this physical distancing where we don't have a social space anymore in our face-to-face -face environment. So online, you have to create that for students, uh, you know, like meeting them on campus or in a cafe or something. So if you want to you know, pop something into that one. There's already a few people who did that. Um, the other thing is, for each of the literacies that I'm okay. suggesting, what are some resources you're using? What are you doing in your classes? I know Kathy S. Miller already actually um, gave a good resource from Teaching Tolerance, which is a great website, and Sean Michael Morris, who's always, always awesome to listen uh, to and read, read from. Um, and the third thing is, do you think there are literacies that I'm missing? Because this is the second version of the article and it's got a different set of literacies. Um, and actually when I'm going into the keynote, I'm gonna focus on particular ones. I'm not gonna be able to cover them all just because of time. But if there's stuff, uh, Nate, you just called me Masa instead of Ma. <laughs> That's a new one. <laughs> I think you're talking about me. Oops, that was a typo, sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, so whichever of these three, obviously if you wanna write something else, that's fine as well. But um, 
I, someone in, I think the previous session was talking about how when you give a more specific direction rather than say, go forth and annotate, uh, it helps. And obviously this reading is actually quite short. Like I think it's probably 1,500 words or something. Um, <laughs> Terry, you're so funny. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, I think uh, go forth and annotate. Uh, and I will be looking into your annotations and I'm, they may or may not make it into the actual keynote. But I will let people, while listening to my keynote, know that this is a space where people have already been discussing these ideas. And that will make it a little bit easier for me not to take more than 30 minutes for my keynote, because right now my slides, I have like 125 slides, which you know I probably won't be able to go through. <laughs> um, but just also letting you know the article on third learning space. So I didn't write um, an article on third learning spaces, but there's a part in my article that you're that Nate just linked right now where I talk about third spaces and um, I've got um, an annotation there for you to refer to that. So Michael is asking about the first step um, to do to annotate. Well, first you have to create a hypothesis account. <laughs> yeah, Which and Michael's, Michael. Michael's put a link in there to you. And just to clarify, uh, my, uh, someone who was asking on the, is there this article on the third learning space? Yeah, that, so that's, that's not an article. I, I don't have an article on it. It's just a line in this article. And gotcha. I haven't actually referenced the work on third. So there's third places and third spaces. And I they're not in, in really interchangeable, but I use them sort of interchangeably. Um, uh, Homi Baba talks about the third space as a cultural hybrid third space, like a bridge between two cultures. But I actually mean it's third place as in it's not the formal space of school and it's not the least formal space of home, but it's somewhere in the middle, like a cafe or like a social space or like the, um, in our institution, the plaza between classrooms where you meet someone and you can have a chat and then move on, uh, that kind of space. Great, yeah, so for, for anybody who hasn't been um, participating before uh, in annotation, um, you can follow the links that I've been putting in chat directly to the article and the article will appear with annotation already enabled. Um, and you can start reading and looking at the annotations that are there. If you want to start participating yourself, you need to create your own hypothesis account, which there's a little link up in the upper right hand corner to do. And in fact, I could share my screen, Maha, if that makes sense and actually go to the article myself. Sure. Um, <clears throat> unless you wanted to do that. Uh, no, you go ahead. All right. I'll check the chat. Oh, there's a lot of chatter chattering going on. Yeah. And I'll just say as a side note to folks who were, um, you know, asking questions about Blackboard integration and like, how do I get the key and secret to install it in Canvas and stuff, reach out to Hypothesis support. Um, and my, my colleague, uh, Michael, is here uh, in the chat. And so they can connect with you. We're not going to focus so much on technical details here in this session because we're really trying to kind of show off annotation. But we also want to help you. So. Um, connect with support at Hypothesis um, and or ping Michael in the chat and he can, he can get you squared away. Uh, let me go back to sharing here. So um, you should be seeing, I got some toolbars in my way. You should be seeing uh, Maha's article here, Literacies Teachers Need During COVID-19. And you'll notice that some of the words in it are highlighted in yellow, right? That means that someone has highlighted them and anchored an annotation to them. If you click on one of those anchors, you'll see that that little drawer on the right sort of slides open, as we call it the sidebar. And you can close or open that sidebar with that little chevron at the top there. Also, it's a little bit hard to see this, but you can also um, adjust the width of the sidebar by dragging the chevron back and forth. <laughs> if you want to make it really wide or really narrow, you can do that. Um, and you'll see at the top, I'm already signed in, so I'm going to log out to show you. But if you don't have an account yet, you can use this sign up link at the top to quickly make yourself an account. Uh, if you already have one and you're not logged in, you can use this login link like I am to actually log in. So now I'm logged back in again. And so you can see that uh, already 11 annotations have been made on top of the article here. 
And so this is the time when we'll just kind of work together to read uh, this text and start to either annotate by making highlights ourselves on particular words. You see, when I grab a word, it calls up this little annotate highlight control. And it's I can usually a bit closer to where you're, you're yeah, um, I know. selecting it. I'm going to refresh. So <laughs> I'm going to refresh here because <laughs> just it, to let, just to let people know something that's a little bit tricky. If you just highlight, that's going to be private to you and nobody's going to see the highlights. But if you write an annotation, that's what's going to appear for other people. And you can choose whether you want to make it private or public, or you can send it to a private group um, if you're doing that for a class. But right now we're doing it publicly. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not sure why it's appearing so far away. One of the things that's a little bit different about Hypothesis than some of the other annotation tools is Hypothesis comes to the content where the content lives. So like you'll see, this is actually an article that Maha published in Alpha and R Media, right? I, I don't actually know the, the outlet that well. Um, and so we haven't taken this article and put it somewhere else, right? What we've done is we brought Hypothesis to the article and because it's a full-blown web page and something, sometimes there are tricky little things going on, like we saw that advertisement pop up and so forth that can change the experience. So um, when you're annotating out on the wild web, the wild <laughs> world wild web, I like to call it here, uh, you might find uh, some little idiosyncrasies like that. Uh, and if you are having any troubles annotating um, or need technical help or assistance, Feel free to reach out in the chat there and uh, my team of super helpful people, including Michael and all, will help you out. I'm gonna be quiet for a minute and let people read. I'm a noisy typer. Shall I mute? <laughs> With your powerful <laughs> fingers. Told, yes, it's because I learned to type on a typewriter when I was like nine or 10. And with typewriters, you have to like press really hard. Yeah, um, me too. And I also play piano a little bit. So that's, that's where my fingers, that's the, it's a nice feeling. That's yeah. That's why I don't like those new keyboards that are all like, there's no key Touchy. movement in them. And they're oh, kind of yeah. it's like, tapping on a piece of glass or something. Yeah, I think what they're probably going to do is that the keyboard will be flat, but you'll have the tactile feeling of as if you've pressed something. I think that's the kind of direction things are going. Right? Yeah, seems like it. Alice is asking, how can I select a text to get started? Do you mean a, a certain amount of just highlight the text instead of getting a copy paste option with it, you'll get an annotation. So for some yes. reason on Nate's, it doesn't show, it shows like very far down. Yeah. See where that is. Yeah, I don't understand why that is. Um, so and I try sharing mine and see what happens. Yeah, I maybe yours, maybe yours will be better. I'll just refresh to try it one more time here. Uh, okay. Oh, mine's still far away. Okay, let's try yours. Okay. Um, and for people who are like installing this in Canvas and so forth, you can do that if you want. Um, that's a, a couple of extra hurdles <laughs> to get to just to annotate this article. The easiest thing to do right now uh, for uh, Jay Yeasting who asked this um, would be uh, just click on one of the links in, uh, in the chat there to open the article and just start annotating here. Getting it in, into Canvas is uh, maybe too big of a hurdle for the short time of this workshop. So if people are seeing this, so see as soon as I click here, the annotate and highlight appear right immediately under the part that I'm highlighting. So, and then when you click on it, it opens up on the right hand side. Yeah, something must be weird about my computer today. I don't know why mine was acting differently. Mm. It does that to me sometimes too, but usually on the phone. Ryan is saying you had to highlight a sentence several times just before it took. 
that usually happens to me on the phone. I don't know. Or maybe if you don't have the book, maybe that's part of what the bookmark word does, but I'm sure that Nate has the bookmark. Yes, PDFs can be annotated, James. So there, there are two things that are interesting about annotating PDFs. One of the most interesting things is even if, you're, if you download a PDF of an article because it's like behind a paywall or something and you annotate it, there's a way to, to make it uh, still uh, sync with other offline annotations of, of that PDF once you connect. Uh, and maybe Nick can share how that happens. Probably easier if you have the LMS integration, but it works even if you don't, right? Yeah, I mean, the thing about PDFs, it's um, cert you can definitely annotate PDFs. So uh, web pages, PDFs, and there's also the possibility to annotate EPUBs in certain circumstances. Um, PDFs are, are annotatable in a couple of different ways. So if you put them into uh, some sort of web, web delivery location, like uh, you know Google Drive or uh, the file storage system in Canvas, or on your own website or something like that, um, and so that they open naturally in a browser, then they become annotatable just like a web page would be. And you can um, either annotate them, uh, you know, using like the Chrome extension uh, or through a special link like we're doing now with Maha's article. Um, for the LMS integration, um, yes, there's, a, there's the ability to either annotate PDFs or web pages um, by, kind of adding them to file storage as you assign them in the LMS as an annotatable reading. So and I'm so sorry, for, I said oh, that Kathy ahead. S. Miller had um, given some links. It was actually Kate Mitchell. Kathy was probably in another article of mine that she was annotating, sorry. I don't know if Kate is with us today, but I'm sorry, Kathy, that I thought that was you. Yeah, and if anybody is having kind of questions or issues around technical support with their LMS at their uh, organization, I apologize that we're not uh, planning on addressing them here. Um, but uh, Michael is in the in the chat, and he's um, he's uh, you know busy answering things away. I also just pasted our support email in there, and so um, we'd love to help you uh, figure that out. We're just not going to do it so much <laughs> in the context of this this workshop. So Mo had asked uh, if uh, making a, a linked word or words into uh, the anchor for an annotation is a good idea. Yeah, Mo, it could be a little tricky right then because when you go in to select the highlight, it could also trigger the link that the highlight is on. So um, sometimes it's helpful if you want to annotate uh, something that's linked is to highlight some words surrounding it too, if possible. Um, and that way it makes the annotation a little bit bigger than the link itself and gives you a place to kind of grab onto it. Amy gave us a baby Yoda, Jeff. Oh, he's so cute. Yeah. I admit that I didn't get onto the whole Baby Yoda bandwagon, but maybe I should. I, I couldn't get into the whole Star Wars part. I tried. I couldn't. Sorry. Uh, we, we don't want to start a whole discussion about that. That could be <laughs> Hey, Gwenerol has a pretty cool question here, Michael, that maybe you can address. Um, wondering if they can change their name, their username in Hypothesis because they started out with a pseudonym and, um, and then wanted to change it later. Um, and uh, that's actually an interesting question just around um, kind of account identities and so forth um, because, uh, you know, pseudonymic annotation can be a great way to have a kind of public participation without like giving away all the privacy <laughs> at once. Um, so pseudonyms can be kind of useful for sometimes for public annotation, right? But there are other times when you do actually wanna annotate as yourself and, and you know, have your full human identity at play. Um, so uh, that's a, it's a, something interesting to ponder. Now in the context of LMS integration, because it's a single sign on environment with the LMS, um, the, uh, it sort of takes the, uh, the uh, uncertainty of what your name is going to be away, right? Because the LMS is providing it based on your, your LMS sign-in. So it's only in the wild that you really have that, uh, 
that flexibility to decide about what who you want to be and what you want to be. And I'll I'll hope that um, uh, Michael has already said that he answered you great. Yeah, so Deborah brings up an interesting question about if everyone contributes, a paper will have hundreds of annotations and how do you deal with that in classes? You know, that came up um, in, the, in the earlier session today too, and that led to a little bit of a conversation around the use of, of private groups. Um, so first of all, in the LMS environment, right, uh, every class and now in, at least in Canvas, every section can have its own and actually automatically has its own private group where everyone in that class or section is, is annotating. And so when that you put a document, for instance, a PDF or a web page in front of that group, right, and assign it as an annotation um, exercise, they're not gonna see the annotations of um, other private groups that have previously annotated that same document. And in fact, in the LMS environment, they won't even see public annotations on it either. Out in the wild, it's a little bit more wild on the on the World Wild Web, um, mm -hmm. where like on as we watch uh, Ma working here on. Nate, her. do you wanna? I'm gonna. I'm just gonna do something. So I'm gonna tell sure. them what I'm doing right sure. now. Sure, sure. So if you look now, you'll see that it's like something like 11 annotations. But you see this red button here? There are 56 new annotations. So we're 100 and something people. Where are the annotations? And I forgot that I need to sort of refresh. So now there are 48. It says. Oh, that 56. Anyway. So yeah, that, get, that gets at your question D. McKenna asked about um, how quickly do the annotations update. So they come pretty quickly, but you may have to hit that button that Ma uh, just hit to, to update your view. And you can see there's already more new ones there. <laughs> since she I, I've already got quite a few useful resources that I might um, refer to. Like, for example, someone mentioned um, when I was talking about workload literacy, someone mentioned Asal Unoy's work and Asal's work someone I really respect. And I've, I actually recorded a podcast about grading, uh, ungrading, I guess, with him and Jesse Stommel recently. And I'm not sure if that podcast is coming out uh, before my keynote or not. I need to check with, I, I need to check with the person whose name now escapes me completely <laughs> who recorded the podcast with us. But there's, a, there's also a link to his book about labor-based grading in there. And it's a very different, very social justice focused approach to assessment that I think is, is worth looking at. So it's interesting how yeah, you read something and you know someone really well, but sometimes when you're writing a particular article, you've forgotten that you know this person and the work they did. And annotation can help a lot with that. And I think this, this really is a, a pretty good reflection of what it's like to annotate together in a class too, right? Because you have different levels of experience with digital tools. You have different levels of literacy, um, both digital and informational reading. You have, you know, uh, different perspectives, which is one of the great things, right? Is because those perspectives can start to come out. And so the first time that everybody does this is always probably the most difficult and most painful. But as you start to do it, you become really adept at it. And I'm to the point now where I actually don't even like to read unless I can annotate at the same time. So it's gotten that I can't really read offline. I, I don't like to read on paper anymore. One of the other things is that I think if students are reading across different articles, I think it can help students who are struggling with avoiding plagiarism because if you're reading across articles and then you come back uh, to write your own piece, like a literature review, it's, it's, it works like the way note cards used to work back in the day, if anyone is as old as I am or around that age where there were still note cards, um, because you, you can clearly see which part you're quoting from the article and which part is your own comment on it. And so you're less likely to make that mistake of inadvertently reusing someone else's words without paraphrasing them. I don't know if anyone used to have that problem, but like before Hypothesis, I used to copy and paste text to remember to use it. And then it would be possible that you sometimes forget to paraphrase it unintentionally. Uh, I, I always assume students don't intend to uh, <laughs> forget to do that. So. Yeah, and I don't know if people remember way back at the beginning of the workshop when Jeremy was talking about how um, 
annotation, collaborative annotation can make reading visible, active and social. And I think Mog just kind of hit on all of those in the sense that, you know, we can see now the traces of everybody's reading on top of this article. So there's a visibility that's brought to it. And there's a visibility in what they were thinking about, right, through the annotations themselves and the conversations that ensued from it. And it kind of slows people down. Somebody, uh, was it, somebody in this conversation earlier, up, earlier in the chat talked about intentional reading. And I think there is, there's a way in which annotation can slow things down and help people become more intentional about their reading and, and actually maybe read less but read with a more active mode of thinking about how they can connect what they're reading to something else, another idea, another person, uh, linking out to another document. I, I'm sure some of these annotations must link to other things. I haven't seen one fly by recently, but it's, it's obviously uh, each annotation is like a little mini web page that has its own URL and can contain links and videos and images and things like that as well. Actually, Ma, can you show them how each annotation has its own URL? Do you know how to find that? Uh, I guess if I click on it. I uh, know it's that little, um, the little uh, box with the arrow just below your cursor. Up, uh, no, nope, down, really? down where the flag, near the flag, next to the flag. Yeah, next uh, to the not flag. the flag. Oh, oh yeah, that one. Yeah, there. The share. Yeah. Yeah. So that URL, and yeah, sometimes I share these on Twitter. You know what it says here? Like, oh, I really like this annotation and I can just share it. Yes, too. Uh, Hoda's getting Soon. impatient. Yeah, when? she is. When? I have to know exactly. 25 minutes, max. So there's a lot of really great uh, conversations going on in the <clears throat> in both the Q&A and the chat that I can't even keep up with. They're coming so fast and furious. So I know that Michael's doing his best <laughs> to answer things there and other team members. Um, and I, I hope that folks um, see this as, um, first of all, a way to get engaged with Maha and her thinking and her keynote that's coming up um, because there's a lot of really great uh, sort of material that's come out of her process to working toward this keynote. Like she mentioned her Twitter thread, which we linked to in the chat before um, this process that we're going through today, all the thinking that she's done. I know she's had a lot of conversations with, with other people in various formats about it. And it's really, I, would you say Ma, that the experience of this keynote has been different for you than other, other talks like that that you've given? Yeah, definitely. The, the the engaging with Twitter before I've done before, I don't think I've ever done a combination of engaging with Twitter and hypothesis. And and there's also a lot of back channeling going on in the large Twitter DM with a lot of my friends. Um, I think partly because of the social isolation, again, because I don't have that opportunity in my face-to-face -face environment as much as I used to. Like, I can't just talk to people, hey, you know, I'm thinking about doing this for my kid. You know, I don't have that anymore. So I have to be more intentional about it. And also just feeling like I can't be with people at the conference where the night before my keynote, I could just, you know, let them know what I'm thinking about. You know, like usually that, that's what would happen. You arrive a day before the keynote, you meet a few people, or you're there for a few days of the conference before your keynote is happening. Um, and I don't think keynotes should be just this isolated thing that's not part of anything else that's going on in the world. And maybe also the thing that's really special about it is that everyone in the world is going through a similar thing. There, there are obviously other things on top of it, um, especially in the US. But the, the pandemic aspect and the need to go online and that suddenly those of us who have been uh, doing online for a long time are sort of center stage in our institutions in ways that we've usually been marginalized before. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting space to be, and I think that kind of makes me feel like more people would be interested in, in what's going on with what I have to say. Yeah, and I can imagine a lot of the folks who would normally attend OLC are in kind of in the in your shoes, right? Where they're they are the kind of people who are engaged in this sudden move to remote delivery that everybody's been engaged in. Um, and so, as a community, we've all been uh, we've all been <laughs> kind of riding that that wave yeah. hopefully surfing it so yeah uh, refresh how many annotations are on there now there's at least 68 um, 
75. <laughs> so you can see, One I mean. One of the things that confuses me is that I've got different, um, uh, different sliders, right? There's a slider here for the right. annotations and there's a slider here for the article. Yeah. So depending on which one you're looking at. And obviously every time I refresh, I keep reading the beginning. Right? Yeah, and this is part of the situation, right, of uh, because we bring the annotation to the website, all the complex complexity of the website is there. And then we throw the complexity of the annotation on top of that. And yeah, sometimes it can seem a little confusing. So, you know, uh, working on a clean PDF, you can even annotate a PDF that's just local on your own computer by just opening it in a browser. Let's say you have the Chrome extension you can open a PDF um, just locally on your own computer and annotate it there. And it can be a much kind of quieter, less noisy experience than a web page that might have ads and all sorts of things going on in it. Um, here's a really uh, interesting point too about annotating PDFs. Because PDFs have unique fingerprints, if I annotate a PDF on my local computer and Maha annotates the same a different copy of but the same PDF on her computer in Egypt, our annotations will actually see each other and find each other and I'll be able to see hers and mine assuming they're public or we're in the same group because Hypothesis ties them together behind the scenes um, knowing that they're part of the same document. Uh, so it, it's a little bit of black magic it feels like but it's um, it can be a really powerful uh, a powerful experience. And so that kind of gets to some of the, like Mike Duval was asking about browser compatibility. You know, we, we have, I'm sure Michael could link you to, um, or if he didn't already, he could link you to uh, a statement about our browser compatibility uh, sort of support at Hypothesis. Um, we basically try to support all the modern browsers. Um, some are more pesky than others. Um, the re it is true that we only have a full blown extension for Chrome although there is a sort of almost finished Firefox um, plugin as well. Uh, but um, that doesn't mean that one can't annotate in those other browsers. It just means that we haven't enabled a you know, native plugin for those browsers. Um, there was another thing that I was thinking about as I was reading all of these annotations and thinking that this is like 70 something and that's going to be even more. Uh, people is that if we were in an actual seminar style class, there would be no way that every single person would get an opportunity to participate. And there, these are 78 annotations. Like there wouldn't be time for 78 people to speak for a minute or two. And then for me to thoughtfully respond to them. But what's going to happen now is that this is sort of a semi synchronous space. Like right now, we're all annotating at the same time. But I can just keep looking at these for the next couple of days, and people can keep coming back. And like I said in my keynote, you know, during my keynote, if I can't get through everything, I can stop thinking, by the way, you can just go and look at the hypothesis annotations later and, and continue to engage with these ideas, right? And that's something that when we, when we valorize the face-to-face -face seminar classroom with its beautiful energy, we forget that it's not a very equitable space and that it's a limiting space. It's a limit of, limitation of time and space that online asynchronous um, work sort of solves that problem. Yeah, a lot of, I think Jeremy, uh, he might have even said this earlier that, uh, that people have described collaborative annotation as the closest thing you can get to having a small intimate face-to-face -face seminar when you don't have that ability. Like you have more people or you're at a distance or you're doing it at different times asynchronously. Yeah, but when you say it's close to, you're, you're okay. making it say, you're sort of saying it's close to but less than. And I'm trying to say it's actually close to and more than. I would agree with that as well. Um, totally. So I don't, I didn't mean to, um, I didn't mean to suggest that it was less. Of course, there are different kinds of affordances. <laughs> you don't get the body language, uh, you know, yeah. channel through the annotations as much unless you upload yeah. a video of yourself, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, there's so many, there are so many rich possibilities in the kind of discussion and who, who the discussion can involve. Uh, an annotation that a lot of times you won't see, you won't find in a face-to-face -face seminar where some people are just either not ready to or not allowed to speak. Yeah. I, actually, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot recently is that if we go back face-to-face, -face, people will be wearing masks so we won't see their facial expressions. We'll hear their tone of voice. 
they can still use bodily gestures, but from a distance. But we won't be able to see their faces, so it won't really be face-to-face. -face. Like the face-to-face -face will be on Zoom, and the face-to-face, -face, like the in-person, will not be face-to-face, -face. it will be mask-to-mask, -mask. right? Right. Um, and I did teach a face-veiled student once, and I know that you can sort of tell what a person is feeling from just looking into their eyes. But I think that's a skill that we're all going to need to learn, especially if you're meeting students you're knowing for the first time, so you don't actually know what they look like with, without the mask. Um, so that will be an interesting I think, situation that we're not used to. Yeah, I mean, this is this is such a a unique time to be like we've the world has never had all the digital affordances, and we still don't have them spread evenly across the world for sure. But we've never had all the digital affordances and as good a reason to use them. Um, and I, I, it's, it's, I feel like it's stepped forward both in some really great ways, but also some troubling ways. And I think you get a, you get a lot of that thinking in this article, and I expect you will in your keynote as well. There are still like hundreds and dozens of kind of <laughs> minor technical questions too. And I keep flipping back and forth from this, the heady dialogue that we're having here to these can, more mundane things. Can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, that is a little bit strange about, not strange, I don't understand why uh, she's preferring that. She's saying, can students know how many annotations or interactions are happening with their, uh, with their, well, annotations, and they can because the, when they when someone responds, they'll get notified. So I'm not sure why you don't why don't you want them to know if people interacted with the annotation. And Kathy, I just uh, I ha I guess I have the ability to allow you to talk with your voice if you want, and so I did. If you would like to respond with your voice, you may not have been ready for that. I. <laughs> Let's see, can you hear me now? Did I do it? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay, yes. okay, so good, thank you for unmuting me. Um, so the reason I ask is uh, thinking about like social media platforms, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and with the students somehow, sometimes uh, the status or the satisfaction that comes with seeing all the people that just like their tweet or something, and then as opposed uh. to Tumblr, yeah, whereas like in Tumblr, um, there seems to be a lot, you know, the people seem to speak to the appreciation they have for not necessarily being able to tell how many people are interacting with with the blog or with the post um so just and i think what surfaced that well, was when you mentioned uh, the valor the face-to-face -face, the fact that in a large class not everyone can contribute and i was just it in the face-to-face -face class it's so easy to see i i don't know i think it would be beneficial if you can't like look at whether or not 20 people have seen your tweet and ignored it or your annotation. Oh, well, they can't, I think they can't sense. tell that they've read it. Yeah, so they can't tell That's, someone's read it, but they can know if someone replied to it. And right, it okay. a more substantial thing. I don't think they can tell if someone's read it. Right, exactly. Okay, so they can't necessarily tell though, like if um, my friend uh, mm. Kaya, 65 people click on her annotation and open it up and yeah. expand it. Whereas no, no one not. expands mind. Okay, that, that's that's my question. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So just the responses, though. which is okay, because that's a substantial type of attention rather than the liking, right? And I don't right? think oh. you know, there was there was. I just gave a heart to Jim Luke's annotation, but I I literally put in an annotation text and just drew a heart. But there isn't the hearting type of thing that you have on Twitter where you can just like and people just like something, but they haven't really engaged with it. So I think that's a good point that you're making there. Um, yeah, you don't want that difference between just someone's stuff gets attention and other one, other people's doesn't. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll apologize in advance. There are so, there are so many different questions popping around now that we may not be able to systematically answer them all. Um, really ranging all the way from um, <clears throat> what Kathy was talking about and in, in that conversation just there about, you know. What, you can stay what quiet for a while so you can do that. Not necessarily. I mean, uh, we like all the all the questions, especially the bigger picture ones, because that's why we invited you here, uh, Maha, even though you're obviously very proficient at the details as well. Um, Farhad did ask if, uh, when we were talking about the ability to annotate PDFs, um, so yes, 
if you emailed the same PDF file to everyone or distributed it to them in some other way, like maybe they got downloaded it from an LMS or something like that, um, if they set up their, their um, computers and everything correctly with, you know, they'd have to use the Chrome browser in this case and have the Chrome extension installed and there's a little uh, switch you have to flip so that it can annotate local files. But if each student did that, and we have help files about it, but if each student did that, uh, they would be able, uh, and they were annotating either all publicly or all in the same private group, they would be able to see each other's annotations on top of that document. So it is possible to do, do things that way, Farhan. We have a lot of um, great resources on our, uh, on our help website that um, Michael spends a lot of time stewarding. Uh, so um, <clears throat> definitely, if you, if you walk away from this experience with any um, remaining technical questions, I invite you to visit our help section. I'll put a link into it in that chat. Um, and we also have a way there to like file a ticket and get a request and then uh, and someone will, will get back to you with an answer. Um, Deborah brought up an interesting thing, Maha, uh, and we don't see it here on this page. Uh, what is the difference between an annotation and a page note? And I've noticed that all the annotations so far on your article are, are annotations or replies to annotations, but there is the capability to add what are called page, <coughs> bless you, or, uh, to add page notes as well. And page notes are annotations uh, for the whole page. So they're not anchored to any specific text on the page. Uh, and if you scroll all the way to the top of the window is where you see uh, the possibility of, of having um, page notes there. So you could add a page note just as Ma is doing it right now <laughs> as a great demonstration. Um, <laughs> and you'll notice also that a lot of people aren't, oh, there, she's adding a, a tag. Perfect, yeah. Make sure people know you're being sarcastic, right? Um, dare you post it. So now, uh, Deborah, you can see that this, uh, this article has both that page note that isn't linked to any specific text and the annotations that are anchored in a specific text. And so people have been asking about like usage on a smartphone. So it's a little tricky on a smartphone actually. And, and part of it has to do with um, the, just the screen real estate you have. I, I bet, Ma, you probably have some experience trying to annotate on your smartphone, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do it a lot. Doesn't always work. <laughs> yeah. It works so best on Chrome again. Honestly, I have to switch to Chrome every time. Um, so it's possible, but it's not, it's not a flawless experience because we don't have a dedicated mobile app that's optimized for mobile use. And the, just the screen real estate of having a text and the annotation interface together um, is a pretty complex problem to solve. So we haven't quite done that yet. Um, we hope to, but it is technically possible. And we know that of course that would make a big difference because a lot of people are in environments where they need to read on their phones. That might be the only way they could read a digital text. And so we certainly understand the need. Um. So I think for me, and I don't know if people know about this, but there are lots of different ways of getting Hypothesis to work. One of them is with the Chrome extension or the platform or whatever it's called. One of them is to go to the Hypothesis website and paste the link. But the one that works, that seems to work well on the phone, but doesn't always work well in general, is the via.hypothesis.is slash the URL. That's like the quickest way to, like you're already on a URL and you just add the via.hypothesis.is at the beginning of it. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to just, can I demonstrate this, Nate? Yeah, give it so a I'm, try. This is a link that one of you uh, posted for me. So I'm just going to go via .hypothesis and just this. And as soon as I do that, it should. And just so you know, if you don't, if you didn't memorize that link that Emma typed in, um, if you just go to the Hypothesis website, there's a menu item, paste the link at the very top and you can, you can just paste a URL there and it will create it for you. Here it is. Yeah. So you can see there are no annotations on it right now, but you can yeah. see. Another so way, which is I'm looking at something else, is the bookmark where you just click here. And that opens it. And if there were annotations, this H would have numbers on it. So you see over here, it says 17 for some reason, but maybe there's a 17. I don't know why it says 17. It's more than that. 
I think Sorry, that badge on. may not update. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, maybe interrupt you. Oh, no, I, I actually just coughed. About 159 uh, annotations so far. Um, that includes replies. Hi, John. Again, I just lost the connection to the server. So John is actually, um, John works with us here at, at Hypothesis, um, and he's, uh, he's asking a question back to you folks who've been <laughs> asking about notifications in the, in the LMS. So if anybody has any input for John, um, please give it back to him there. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for coming and, and anybody else too. I realize that we're about five minutes away uh, from the top of the hour. Um, and it's been a really, uh, really great experience. Um, I thank you all for staying so long. Um, big thanks to all our, our panelists. Um, I know Monica, Monica, sorry, I'm mispronouncing everybody's name today. Monica and Kat are still here. Ben might still be here too. Yeah, Ben's still here. I know uh, Veronica had to leave. And uh, obviously- there, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A that I think are probably yeah. have quick answers. Is there a table that compares hypothesis and perusal and the question about can you tag someone on responding? I don't think you can tag someone, but if you respond to the person, they'll get a notification. Right, Aaron? Yeah, I saw those and I was just, um, I'm not totally avoiding them, but there's also, <laughs> there's dozens of questions that have been asked in chat that we haven't had a chance to address yet either. Um, a couple of people did raise that question about um, perusal. Perusal is another annotation um, tool that has an LMS integration. It has a couple of different things about it, like you have to upload text to it, or you can actually have your students buy textbooks through it that then become annotatable. Um, and it has some nice things about it. Um, it's a completely different model uh, than the way Hypothesis works. Um, uh, and we uh, have been talking about better ways to compare the two tools. So we, we, don't, um, we don't have a really good summary, Usha, yet of, of that comparison. Um, but we would try to, try to have something for you. I, I definitely recommend exploring both because uh, they have just the, the fundamental difference of whether you're bringing the annotation to the text where it lives or you're bringing the text to the annotation can make quite a big difference. Um, Perusal also has some built-in sort of quote unquote, AI robotic grading mechanisms that some people like. Uh, I'm not really a big fan of automatic grading mechanisms myself, but if that appeals to you, um, perusal might be interesting. Yeah, Darlene has asked a really important question there around textbooks and textbook annotation. And so um, <clears throat> I will say, uh, Darlene, that that is like the, a third chunk of a big area of content, right? That a lot of people do reading and annotation would be really powerful in. And so um, right now, if, if the textbook exists as in PDF format and can be um, accessed that way, although it also could be a mighty big PDF and it might not work so great as a gigantic PDF for all those reasons, um, but that is one way that it could work. If it, uh, some of the open textbooks work well because they actually, uh, you know, appear to the world as websites. Um, so if it's, if it's an open textbook like that, they can be annotated. We are in the middle now of working with some of the big textbook platforms and providers to get hypothesis embedded into those environments. So we, we know that people want to use um, hypothesis on textbooks. And this is one of the big questions around STEM use, actually, because a lot of the STEM classes make heavy use of textbooks. But we really need to um, have better ways to have hypothesis embedded in those native readers that, where people experience the textbooks a lot, like the vital sources and red shelves and Macmillans and Pearsons, et cetera, of the world. So we're working on those um, kind of partnerships and integrations. Um, and so that is kind of the next area where we're expanding into, but it's, it's, not, it's not there yet. Yeah, so here we are, 1.59 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, what time is it for you, Maha? It's 11. I think she's hungry. Yeah. I tried to get her to eat something before we started, but she didn't. <laughs> Maybe but she's we, playing with her friends. <laughs> okay. 
Well, maybe we should, since it's 11 at night at Cairo, maybe we should let Maha go to bed and, and maybe get some food for herself and her daughter. Um, it was so great to have you here. What an honor. Uh, thank you so much. I really look forward to your keynote. Thank you. Thank you, Kat, also. You're still here. <laughs> Good to see your smiling face. Um, and everybody else who attended, thank you. Um, Maha, did you want to say anything before, before it ends? Just a very big thank you, and I'm going to go back into these annotations. Hopefully, I have a couple of days <laughs> to sort of try to absorb them. Thank you all so much. Well, again, this was um, probably the best hypothesis workshop I've ever attended. So thank you all for making it be what it was. I, uh, I learned a lot too, and I'm overwhelmed. We will um, be capturing both video and text-based uh, artifacts from this and distributing them out. So uh, y'all signed up with email addresses, and uh, as soon as we can, we'll be emailing you with, with outcomes and, and artifacts from this experience, including cat slides. <laughs> Thank you all. I've been so inspired by all the panelists and all the people who've joined us today. Um, you know, it's just so nice to connect with everyone and thanks everyone for being here. And Monica, Jeremy, anybody else want to say goodbye? Franny? Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks everyone. It's really great. Yeah, thank so you. Good. People, people have turned off their cameras and are, are slipping into the evening, I think. Great, well, I'm gonna turn off the recording then and we're gonna call this a wrap.